Welcome, everybody. I think we'll crack on. Um, we've got apologies from Paul Corrigan and Camilla Cavendish, who are on their summer holidays. Um, Anna Bradley's joining us in about 20 minutes, and Mike has left his papers upstairs. We'll be, we'll be back in, in a minute. Um, is everyone happy with the minutes? Um, and has anyone anything to declare? Any conflicts of interest or declarations of interest? No. Um, there are no matters arising until September, and so we're straight on to your report, David, please. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks, David. Um, so there's 12 uh, items in this report, so it's a, bit, um, it's a bit full and a bit meaty, but the first four are for... Um, I'm inviting the board to agree uh, to the approach to the recommendations that are contained here. Um, so what I'll do is I'll present them in slightly more detail, David, and then I'll um, do um, items 5 to 12 uh, much more briefly and um, at, at, at speed. Um, the only exception to that will be item 5, which is about Orchard View. Orchid view. Um, more about that. Um, so the first item is really about the delivery plan. Um, previously identified that there's an imbalance between the work that we need to undertake during this year and the number of staff that we've got available to do that work, uh, particularly in the early part of this year. In the uh, business plan uh, for 14, 15 and 15, 16, it was a two year business plan, we committed to actually inspect all hot trusts, general practices, dentists and all adult social care facilities in that two year period. The trajectory for that was a lot of it was backloaded into the second pot, uh, into the second year, 15-16. What has become clear uh, is that we have not been able to recruit the number of staff at the pace that we originally anticipated at the beginning of this financial year, and therefore the number of people we've got to complete the inspections during um, the early part of this year. Um, uh, we've got insufficient staff. Uh, we were right to hold the standard on recruitment and set the bar high. Um, we've been focusing on the uh, improving the quality of our inspections, and what this means is that we'll undertake fewer inspections this year compared to the same period last year, but they will be of a higher quality, they'll be more comprehensive, more thorough and more in-depth. Um, and as a consequence, we'll deliver more inspection days in the second half of this year than we did in the second half of last year. So we'll do fewer but better inspections during uh, the second half of the year. Um, and our focus will be on those uh, locations where we feel that there is some risk to the quality and safety of services in the way that we'll prioritise what it is that we will do. Um, what I'm asking for in this report, what the executive team are asking, because this has been debated and discussed endlessly at the executive team, is for you to agree that approach. So what I'm asking you to agree is uh, uh, that we'll do uh, fewer inspections than in the uh, same period last year, but they'll be more thorough, more comprehensive, and it will result in more inspection days. The consequence of that is it will give some relief to our workforce, our staff, our colleagues, who are experiencing overwork, and the risk is that our sickness levels will go up, the quality of work will suffer, and then we'll end in failing in doing what we've set out to do. So what we're trying to do here is strike a balance between supporting our staff to do what we're asking them to do and actually delivering against uh, our two-year uh, 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 work programme as set out in the business plan. So if I pause at that point, David. Before we just open it up, can I just have a comment from one of the chief inspectors, just just to give a bit more of a flavour about their own particular area before we have open it up a bit. Andrew or Mike or Steve. Um, okay, I, I, both of us would. I mean, I, I think that um, what we're finding is that, um, and I think that this is in common um, a, across the inspectors, is that the, um, the new uh, style of inspections takes longer. 
you know, it takes longer because, as David says, it is more in depth, it's more thorough, um, and it will be a much better pr um, uh, quality um, of report and judgment that we make at the end of it. Um, so that's, I mean, obviously for, for Mike, I mean, that's all of his inspections in, in hospitals at the moment. Um, for me, it's been uh, the testing that we've done in wave one and now in wave two. Um, and that's put additional pressure uh, into the system. Um, the second thing is, is that we're also seeing a very significant um, uh, uh, pressure on staff responding to issues that are being raised um, with us, either from people who are using services um, or um, their relatives and carers and staff through whistleblowing contacts. And I think there's been an awful lot of activity that people have been doing there. And then the third thing, so that's the kind of demand side of it. And then if you look at the supply side of it, um, uh, which is the numbers of inspectors and their managers that we need to make sure um, uh, are doing this. Um, we set our plans with the expectations, really, um, uh, of having um, a, an establishment from the beginning of the year which would help us to deliver that. You know, actually, you know, we were never going to be there, really, and we probably should have worked that one out um, earlier. Um, but equally, because we've had such a significant um, uh, um, uh, number of applications uh, in terms of the recruitment drive that we've done, um, and because we've been doing that in the thorough and rigorous way um, that Eileen and her team have been leading on, um, you know, the, 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 the pipeline of new staff coming in is much, much slower. Um, so we're not actually going to see um, the, the levels of people needed to do that activity. And certainly what I'm getting back from um, inspectors in adult social care is that they are feeling very pressurised, um, that uh, they're working very long hours, um, and you know, certainly we've had um, uh, uh, members of staff feeling quite stressed as a, con as a consequence of that. Um, so I think that you know, given that we have a duty of care um, to our staff um, to make sure that they're um, capable of doing the job properly, um, uh, we need to make sure that we're balancing those two things up. So we have discussed it at length. Um, and we've gone over these figures um, and we've discussed that within each of our senior management teams as well. So I think that this is a considered position that we brought to the board today. Uh, thanks. So, um, so I, I can see the, I mean, in, in principle, I think it's hard to disagree with, with the general thrust of trying to make, um, put emphasis on our priorities. Can I just check that, that uh, we've gone far enough in doing that? The, um, so just looking at the, your paper, David, it, it, um, uh, we, we're planning to inspect services that don't actually lead to ratings. So, that, so some, some of the services in the dental sector, children's services. Now, I can see why they, we might want to inspect them, but if they don't lead to ratings, is that our priority? Um, we've got 10,000 uh, social care inspections in the old approach. Um, which I'm assuming are not risk-based. I'm just trying to remember this right because it's not, they're not list as risk, listed as risk-based in the table. So that means the, the basis of selecting those 10,000 is routine, presumably. So is it necessary to have 10,000 inspections by a method which we are about to scrap? Um, and thirdly, uh, not to preempt a later item on the agenda, but we're going to hear a report about the hospital inspections which suggests that we've almost done them too comprehensively, that the teams are too big. Um, now, if that's true, um, maybe we should be pushing ahead with a decision to reduce the size of teams and therefore make more inspections uh, possible. So, general, uh, you get my point. I'm, I'm in support of the general thrust of what you've said and no, I don't think there's any criticism attached to anything you've said, uh, but have we, are we, do we need to do some of the things that we're still committed to? Take your last point last, which you might want to respond to, I think, and take your first points first, which is David and Andrea. Um, uh, on, on, on the adult social care, um, there's uh, two 
really important things to say about why we're continuing to do the um, old style in, in inspections. The first is that um, uh, we are prioritising those inspections on the basis of responding to risk. Um, so that's risk that's either identified through safeguarding or whistleblowing, um, and sometimes that's just bringing forward the date of the inspection as opposed to um, uh, uh, being completely de novo. Um, uh, so we're, we're, we're doing that to make sure, and those will not result in a rating because we're not kind of following the new methodology um, uh, in doing that. Um, and I think that that's important for us to continue to do um, while, um, while we're learning and developing um, the new approach. The second thing to say is that learning, and we're going to pick up on um, uh, the action uh, from Orchid View later, but one of the things that we learned um, from the um, uh, introduction of new methodologies and new ways of doing things in the kind of 2010-11 um, period of time was that we didn't do inspections um, to quite into the level um, uh, that um, uh, we might have expected. And the level of enforcement activity fell um, significantly at that time too. Um, and so there's, although... I, I don't have the, the blessing that Mike has of the, the kind of risk data um, that enables us to be um, uh, very focused about where we should be going. What we do know is that um, the inspections that we carry out will uncover risk. Um, and that if we don't do that, we are potentially leaving people vulnerable um, to, to that, uh, that continued risk. So I think it's, it's important for us to continue to be doing that so that um, uh, we're, we're not leaving services too long um, uh, until their next inspection. Um, but what I have done, Lewis, um, is written out to um, all um, staff uh, uh, and managers within adult social care to say, your first priority is to respond to those issues that are being raised with us as concerns, and that's what we want to do. We'll do scheduled inspections if we can, uh, and we are continuing to do that, but their first priority is, the, uh, 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 is responding to risk. Just check I understood what, what, what you said there, Andrew. Uh, in the, the 10,014 um, inspections that we're estimating for the rest of this year, in, in by the old style, are they all uh, locations where the, a, a risk has been raised? No, they're not all, um, but some of them will be. My point is, my point is um, if, we're, if we haven't got enough staff, maybe... Uh, I, of course I agree that where risk has been raised with us, they become a priority for inspection. I, I'm just asking what, why we're doing all, so many by an old system. It sounds like quite a few of them haven't had a risk raised about them. And I, I know that some of them will have risk that we haven't uncovered yet. I understand all that. But it's a question of deciding what we do first and what we do in this year with a, with a, a, a staff pool that is not as big as we thought. And so the, the question is whether um, we could prioritise a bit more within that 10,000. So that is what we have done, um, and I've written out and been very clear in the kind of bullet point list of starting at the top. These are the priorities. Um, that's the expectation that, that the deputy chief inspectors and heads of inspection have with their inspection managers in terms of planning and scheduling the inspection activity that we're doing in adult social care. So um, I'm sorry I can't give you the precise numbers as to um, how the 10,000 breaks down into um, what's risk-based and what's not. And um, Paul um, is suggesting that he might be able to help me there. Um, um, but um, uh, we, um, we have been very clear with staff that, um, that the sort of you know, um, scheduled inspection, inspection, standard inspections, um, we, we do if we can. And the, the other issue to be clear about as well is that this is not, um, it's not kind of uniform across the country. Um, so um, we have particular pressures, for example, in our central region, where we've got a much higher level of vacancies um, and we've got more staff available in other parts of the country. <coughs> it's not quite so easy to transfer them all around and, uh, and have them moving for all of the reasons which I'm sure you can understand. So there's some parts of the country where it's perf we're, we're perfectly OK to be continuing to do scheduled inspections. So it's balancing all of those things up. Um, on the numbers, on the 10,000, um, that's totals over the year, and the vast majority of them have already happened. So this is the 10,000 is um, planned for quarter one and quarter two. 
So uh, 5,000 certainly happened in quarter one, and we continue that progress through uh, the quarter that we're currently in. So it's not a question of having 10,000 in the future. Um, and the other thing to um, echo when Bill and Andrew is saying is that the we'll have completed that by the 10,000 by the end of September. If we there's a question of what, what else could our, those inspectors be doing if they're not yet trained in the new approach? Then it's not a question that we could just transfer them in August or in September into doing new approach inspections because our first principle is that each of our new approach inspections has to be carried out, led by people who are trained, which is what we're currently going through. Could you just address the second point that, that um, yeah. Lewis raised? From hospitals, I mean, like Andrea, we've got a much clearer idea now of the demand side um, than we did at the beginning. It has taken time to recruit. We had also to see how many staff wanted to go into which directorate, and fortunately we were in a position of being able to accommodate everybody into their, their first choice of, of directorate. But that d did mean that in certain parts of the country, for example in mental health, um, we uh, were very short. We are now um, going absolutely full tilt at recruitment and training, um, and so I think this will get better. The other uh, additional thing that we are doing now um, is actually to invite people to come on secondment and, and uh, to, to CQC from the NHS. And we've just written out to um, trusts saying, find us your best staff at, at, at a sort of middle grade, um, come to work for CQC for a, a couple of years. Um, we will train you in our methodologies. But then my hope is that they would then be able to go back and that would actually help to improve quality and safety in the NHS. So I think we're doing everything we, we can. Specifically on Lewis's point, and we can come back to this, of course, with the Kieran Walsh report, I think there's, there's large teams and there's very large teams. Um, some of the... Uh, some of the inspections that we did in, in Wave 1 were of extremely large trusts. Bart Health is the, is the most obvious example, where you've got Whips Cross, Newham, Royal London, Bart, uh, Mile End, and the, the London Chest Hospital. We were experimenting at that stage about what was the size of team that, that would be best for that sort of team. Do, do you have a longer inspection and get, take one team round, or do you have effectively three teams working in parallel, uh, which is what we chose to do as a pilot of that. Um, I don't think there is necessarily a right way or a wrong way. I don't think we would have teams of that size again. Having said that, for our sort of standard size of team, I don't think we would want to reduce the size of team on, on that because we need the range of clinical expertise to give the credibility. I think we'll have a longer discussion about that probably when we get to Kieran Walters' report. Um, yeah, I mean, just to say that I do support um, what's um, outlined, obviously, as, as a good employer. Um, but also, I think, you know, in the past, I've been quite concerned that we've focused too much on sort of quantity and hitting targets and number of inspections. And, of course, inspections are important and they are our kind of linchpin. Um, but I also think that it, it's, you know, we need to also say, you know, that this is... is also about quality. I know you have said that, but I think we need to maybe even, you know, this isn't simply about we can't meet the numbers. It's actually that we want to do things differently and we want to do things of a better quality. And it, it isn't just about inspections. It's also about um, responding to concerns, liaising with um, patients, other bodies, um, writing good reports, you know, and all that is part of the kind of the quality. So um, Although, you know, we are struggling to recruit, I think also we need to be very clear that, that it is actually we're focusing on really the, the total quality of, of the way we regulate. Um, so there's a kind of shift there and we need to kind of acknowledge that. Yeah. I think that's a really important point. I think in the way we judge our own performance, it's not, it is not just numbers of inspections. I think we all accept that, don't we? Well, clearly, I absolutely agree that um, if we're going to inspect, we should do so to the quality, a quality which addresses the risks and uh, increases the prospect of patients being looked after safely. Um, can I just ask, ask this, that if the original intention was to inspect everyone, as it were, within a, a period, we're now not going to, to do that, it, do we now have a plan as to when everyone will have been inspected by... Um, and the reason I ask that is, is this, that um, 
I'm conscious of the fact that Mid Staffordshire arose partly because no one thought it was a risk, wrong, wrongly. Uh, and I appreciate that the CQC is working very hard on better intelligence and, and, and so on. Are we sufficiently confident yet in our intelligence system that if there are risks, we will know about them? And if not, uh, how do we cover that? Is it worth the known unknowns in, in our work? Paul, would you like to have a crack at that, please? Um, we have significantly more confidence than we had in the past um, on the quality of our intelligence, but it does still vary significantly sector by sector. Uh, it's probably strongest in the acute sector. Um, and we've used the intelligent monitoring system uh, to, uh, as one of the inputs into who we inspect early on, which is why um, there are more uh, potentially riskier trusts, I put it that way, in the 1415 programme, um, what we've announced so far. Um, and that was a conscious decision. Um, and we look at that quarter by quarter, uh, Mike and myself and others. Um, but what I don't think David said at all was that we were planning to uh, push out the back end of the programme, um, because there's so much between now and either December 2015 for the acute sector or March 2016 for at our social care and primary medical services that we still need to settle. We need to look at what our recruitment profile is going to be. We need to look at what the efficiencies in the model can be. Um, and we need to learn from the WAVE programmes that uh, are currently underway that it wouldn't be right to say because we're doing uh, less activity than we'd originally uh, had um, projected in for 14-15, that definitively means we're pushing the back end of the programme out. There may be ways to catch it up. Just on the, the, the real substance of Robert's question, though, is how good, it, how good is our intelligence of picking up, I think particularly in hospitals, but I think across the piece, I think we, need, we must come back to that. I think we will discuss it a bit in the performance report later on today, but I think it's such a, such a crucial area that maybe we can come back we we'll spend some more time on that in, you know, September or October. Uh, yes, so we've got, um, we've got a paper later on, um, and we'll have an update paper evaluating the first year of the, uh, on the new acute model for October. So we'll okay. do, do both those things. Yeah. Okay. Jennifer? It's just an obvious point that um, it could be that the recruitment is not necessarily a temporary problem. It could be that it's just um, that the level of uh, staff we need is just not tenable, not sustainable, uh, not possible, or indeed desirable. Um, ultimately, uh, after the first, you know, wave of inspections, new style. So we'll have to obviously um, pull point, you know, revise, I guess, keep under revision the depth, breadth, frequency, risk-based nature of the analysis, and that relates to fees too, doesn't it? Um, that's an implication. So uh, I think just to keep returning to this is the obvious point. Well, can I just connect? Um, Robert and Jennifer's point. Um, so, in a sense, Paul's answer on the intelligent monitoring stands in terms of the point you were raising, Robert, about the degree of confidence. But what this uh, proposal uh, that we're discussing is asking you to do is note the position for this current year. Uh, our objective was by March 16 to have inspected and rated everything. We're not making any proposal in relation to whether that should be altered at all. But to come to your point, Jennifer, on recruitment, uh, uh, if my colleagues could help me on this, I think uh, Andrea's running at about 600 people when uh, ideally for this year we would have been running at 653, I think, off the top of my head. And even within that 600, there's a number of people that are seconded out doing other jobs. Um, I think Mike's um, about 250 down, of which the biggest proportion is in mental health, which is why that targeted campaign for comments in mental health is there. So your point is that we've set a bar for the standard we want for people to come into the organisation. I think we need to hold that standard. Uh, but the consequence is the flow of people in uh, might be not as uh, strong as we originally anticipated. So I think the work that we need to do, and I've asked, we get already a weekly report on the numbers of people coming through. 
I did the corporate induction this morning. There were three in, uh, early this week. There were three inspectors. I did one two weeks ago. There were seven inspectors. So people have started to come through the uh, recruitment campaign and the corporate induction. The issue is whether that flow is going to be rapid enough. Uh, to hit the numbers that we originally thought. We need to look at that. The second floor that we need to get is all those new people coming through need to go through the academy and get 30 days training before they're good to go. Uh, so that's the second. Um, now that's up and running. Uh, that work has begun. And current inspectors need to go through 15 days training. Elsewhere in my report, We've got the need for people to be trained in the regulations. That, that's simply the acquisition and knowledge. That's not a skill base. You just need to know what the regulations say. So what we're trying to do is sequence the flow of people into the organisation and then the training so they're good to go. And then the, uh, the conversion, I'm not sure it's the right word, but the conversion of our current staff in the new methodology so they're good to go. So the issue that's trying to be balanced here is making sure we've got enough people uh, in the organisation, and then those people have got the skills to do the job we're asking them to do. And they've got to be available for the beginning of the next year. So effectively what this decision I'm asking you to take today is doing is saying the trajectory by which we'd get to March 16 is changing the flight path. So instead of a gradual takeoff, what we've got is a takeoff, and there'll be a steep climb in the second year. So to have a steep climb in the second year, we need enough people, and they need to be good to go. So I think that's our job in the autumn, in the, business, in the detailed business plan, to set out how we can do that. And if there's a risk to us doing that, we need to identify that and bring that back to the board as part of our planning. So, um, so the degree of... I'm confident about the intelligent monitoring, although I'm sure we'll talk about false positives and false negatives when we get to that report. Um, in relation to next year, what we're saying is um, we need to do the detailed planning, not on a modelling basis, where we say, if we have this many people, this is how much we could do, but on an actual basis, we've got this many people, this is what we can do. And what we've had in the business plan is a model based on our assumptions about how the new inspection methodology will work, and already, I think, that's been challenged by the number of repeat inspections we've got. And they really are picking up to uh, concerns that have been reported through, which have meant we've gone back to more places than we originally anticipated in the first model, not just that our inspections are taking longer than they previously did. That's why we're delivering more inspection days, because there's a bigger proportion of revisits or inspections which are a response to a concern which is being raised. And I don't think we anticipated all of those. I think we anticipated about one. Um, I can't remember what the figure was, so I'm not going to quote it. But um, uh, we've, we've actually had more return inspections responding to concerns than we originally anticipated. And um, that actually, to me, sounds like a success in that um, it's inspection working because you're finding things that you weren't expecting to find and responding to them. <laughs> Quite so, and I think that part plays to Kay and David's yeah. quality point rather than just hit the numbers. And, and that's why we've put the inspection days in. It's not a trick, but actually we are doing fewer but better, and that results in more inspection days being delivered. Anything to raise? Well, only one, one point which um, really builds on comments that colleagues um, have mentioned and, and I, I think this is really a question f for Paul I think um, if one takes Orchid View which um, there's an appendix about although as you've pointed out intelligent monitoring will never surface the same amount of uh, data or granularity as as it can do with um, acute hospitals. Is the current state of intelligent monitoring or intelligent monitoring as it will be in the second half be good enough to have picked up the, you know, in the case of Orchid View, you know, various um, uh, pieces of data like uh, the local authority stopping sending uh, residents to Orchid View, the um, unexpected fatalities and so on, because I think that would give a lot of confidence to um, uh, to the CQC being able to say um, 
you know, we have now put in place a much better uh, risk tracking uh, capability, and therefore the inspections that we are going to do, we will we will not um, not inspect somewhere where there are uh, indications of risk. So, because on the adult social care intelligent monitoring, um, we're still at very much at the prototyping stage, um, and it won't go live until quarter three. Um, it is too early to say definitively we would pick up an orchid view or um, other sort of similar case. What we're doing as part of the testing, though, is to look at the, the various metrics that we're using and then run, run them back and say exactly that question, would this have put, picked it up? Within that, then, there's a, would it have been picked up effectively on the hard data alone? And a separate question is how effectively are we bringing in the knowledge that is either in the in the system or frankly with our inspectors but hasn't perhaps in the past come together into a holistic picture so that combination of uh, sort of slightly pejorative terms the hard and the soft data uh, but is absolutely part of the testing process to look at real examples in much the same way as we asked ourselves would we have picked up mid staffs with our new uh, acute intelligent monitoring and we feel they're much more confident that we would have done partly on the basis of the um, uh, concerns and complaints data, also on the basis that Midstaff was outlying on mortality. And if I could just add to that, um, because as, as Kay quite rightly um, said, one of the other really important things that we're expecting um, uh, us all to be doing is establishing um, a proper partnership um, working arrangements. Um, with people both at a national and at a local level. And one of the critical relationships um, are the inspectors and inspector managers with local authorities. And we've um, structured um, the Adult Social Care Directorate so that our kind of unit, if you like, of, uh, uh, of reference um, are the local authority boundaries so that we can identify key people who can be liaising um, across. And we've got some excellent examples um, which we're trying to make make sure um, we replicate across the country um, where uh, inspectors, inspector managers with their colleagues and local authorities are indeed proactively sharing that information um, uh, between each other um, around the, the problem areas, how each bit of the system, either from a safeguarding point of view or a regulatory point of view or um, whatever else it may be, um, are responding to the risks. So, so I think there's another element of it from our point of view, which is making sure that we're getting that local intelligence and using it um, uh, uh, in a much more meaningful way. Paul, I wonder, uh, outside the board, whether we ought to just set up a couple of hours for a workshop of some kind for board members who want to, who'd like to review the risk model on adult social care in end of September or whenever, whenever you're ready to do it. Yes, let me take away get what the, the right time is to do. Let me take away when the right time is to do that, but September or possibly October, yes. Okay, thanks. Mike. Can I just build, build on what uh, Andrew has said about local intelligence? Um, and going back to Robert's original point, I am a huge supporter of the intelligent monitoring and it is proving useful, but it is not enough on its own. And I think it is important to say that we have at least one trust that's gone into special measures that did not come out high on intelligent monitoring. Um, so it is possible to have trust. Um, and so we need the local intelligence as well. We, we need uh, to look at all of those different things. So it, what we're finding in, the, in general terms, when things come out as high risk, we, we find problems. N not always, but, but in general. Um, but even in the acute sector, I don't think we could absolutely rely on intelligence monitoring and as I've said to others if we could then we wouldn't need to be doing the inspecting um, so um, so uh, yes we need to do inspecting and the local intelligence you agree with that Paul 100 yeah, percent okay um, David can we move on please uh, um, so what this item is doing is just asking you to consider um, some triggers for the approach that we will take to uh, serious incidents, incidents and using our investigatory powers. 
Um, the beginning of the uh, paragraphs is setting out that we've not had a consistent approach. There have been various interpretations uh, about how this has to be taken forward. So the first paragraph in italics is inviting you to consider that that should be uh, a policy position for CQC in the way that we will uh, take forward uh, responding to serious incidents. And that includes, uh, for the sake of clarity, unexpected deaths in all care sectors that we regulate. Just to pull out that this uh, uh, means there won't be a presumption that all serious incidents uh, will be automatically reviewed as individual cases uh, for the sake of clarity. Um, what this means is that we need to ensure we've got the capability and capacity in four areas and they're uh, spelt out. I'll not present each one of them, uh, but that's to ensure that we're able to do them, to do this work with, um, um, with clarity. Um, we do have powers to investigate. Um, if, if I could ask uh, that colleagues delete serious um, from uh, the, the um, sentence in that last paragraph on page three, it, I think the powers are more about investigating where there's risk of harm to people. But over the page, what we uh, set out are the triggers that we should use for where we do uh, use the powers that we've got to carry out an investigation. Again, um, I'm sure colleagues have uh, read them. I'll, I'll not present each of them. But in presenting them in the text, we've tried to identify examples of um, cases that you're probably familiar with uh, or may be aware of uh, to give some uh, examples to uh, help uh, in this decision. So effectively, what um, I and the executive team uh, and uh, colleagues that have been working on this issue are asking is that you note this work uh, note that there's further work to do, but in the meantime, that we'll use the triggers which are at the top of page four to take forward any investigations that we carry out from here. The purpose of that is we'll get some consistency across all our areas of work in the way that we take it forward uh, and we'll do some further work. The reason the further work is required is just to make the point, and perhaps I should have put this in the report, there is an ongoing discussion about whether some of the functions that currently reside with NHS England on safety should transfer to us. And of course, they will have a bearing on exactly this issue. So uh, this uh, work isn't completed, not because we've not done uh, the intellectual lifting on this, but because there's further developments that we need to take forward. So this is a holding position, an interim position, if you wish, that just allows us some consistency to move forward. So if I pause at that point, David, and uh, the colleagues may wish to come back. Um, I quite understand that neither this organisation nor any organisation can investigate everything in every individual case. Um, I'm sure I'm not alone in having a post bank full of um, issues raised by people who say they've suffered from an incident which they can't get anyone to investigate. Um, to have a presumption that we won't review individual cases if they're serious is, I understand that, but if every organisation does that, then serious cases do not get investigated as individual cases. Um, the Gillian Asprey case, which you mentioned in, the, um, uh, in um, one of the bullet points quite rightly, is a classic example of a case which there was significant resistance to being investigated as an individual case, despite everything you say about it, um, about it there. Uh, so I'm, I'm not, not in any way saying your bullet, the bullet points here are, are wrong. They're clearly not wrong. And there needs to be a system whereby it's decided which cases are worthy of, uh, of being in investigated individually. But do you think that what we're setting out here addresses sufficiently the point that um, if everyone says the same thing, serious cases fall through the cracks? Um, I think there is a risk of that, Robert, just to 
in a sense, give a straight answer to a straight question. The issue for us, though, is what we will do, as distinct what others will do. And part of one of the things that we need to assure when we're inspecting, particularly trusts, and when uh, Mike's teams go in, and this speaks to the point earlier, Mike was discussing with Lewis about the composition of teams. If we think there are concerns about the way incidents are investigated in a trust, then we need to make sure that the team going in to do the inspection is able to actually explore that issue on site. And um, you will know better than any of us just how variable it is, how uh, investigations take place. And certainly, um, Pulse Mike that I think Mike gets, I will get, uh, certainly David will get, will be, there will also be cases where people feel that they've not got. Um, uh, anybody to listen to them, let alone investigate their complaints in any kind of detail. So I think there's a difference here. Uh, there's two things we need to do. Firstly, we need to make sure that those organisations which have a responsibility for carrying out investigations in the first place and then communicating with the people that have suffered as a result of the issue that's being investigated, uh, those people carry out those investigations. I don't mean coroner's courts, I mean the trusts themselves. And then the second thing, um, I think this report is saying is that where things do come to us, there will be some circumstances where we actually do need to look at individual cases. Indeed, I've got an individual case at the minute which um, we're working with um, NHS England to carry out an investigation. This is a very old case of a family whose child died. They've not had resolution. They feel nobody has listened to them, including CQC. And uh, we're taking uh, some action to work with NHS England where they can use their powers to carry out a much more historic investigation to see if we can actually get some resolution to those individuals. I think that's a very exceptional case, and I'm sure you'll get more exceptional cases. Um, so I think what we're trying to do here is strike a balance. In truth, um, uh, and maybe some of my language in this report has been too cautious, I think there's been a presumption that all deaths of people with mental health problems will be investigated. And this is the, ambigu this is the ambiguity point. And what we're trying to do here is just be absolutely clear about the approach we're going to take on that. Um, Part of the discussions with NHS England is uh, of the transfers that come, are some of the transfers about what they would otherwise investigate or do they keep those investigation? And this is still fluid at the minute. That's still the subject of the discussion that we need to land. Uh, those conversations will take place over the summer and into the early autumn. Uh, and I hope that we can get some clarity in relation to this. So as I say, this is a holding position pending those uh, larger discussions. It's not a perfect position, and I think you're right to identify that there is a risk that some people may still continue to be angry, frustrated, uh, unhappy that um, people aren't listening to them. Anna, yes. Thanks very much. Apologies for being late. Um, I, I just, just, I, mean, I absolutely recognise the, the, the kind of half, halfway house that you're describing. We're on a, on a, on a journey in relation to these powers, but um, I think the assumption behind your proposition here is that we need a level playing field where we apply the same criteria across all sectors. And I think what I want to say is that um, I'm not sure that that's appropriate, even in this holding position, because the situation in all the sectors is not the same. So uh, the legal requirements and uh, 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 powers that others have to, to, to do investigations in different areas are, are, are um, I understand, quite different. Now, I'm not an expert on, 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 on all the sectors, quite clearly. That's not my, my bailiwick. But one of the things that has come uh, uh, to our attention at Health Watch England particularly is, is exactly this question of deaths in, uh, 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 of people with mental health uh, issues in, 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 in secure institutions and the, 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 the legislation around the requirement for investigations of, in that area is quite different to the legislation uh, that applies um, in, in, in other sectors. So, and it's lesser in terms of the uh, um, uh, independence of investigation. So, so it seems to me that this is not a level playing field. And, and in a way, to, to speak to um, uh, 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 Robert's point too, I mean, I, I think there's, there's something in your criteria which needs to reflect the fact that the context in the sectors will be different and that the powers that other players have in each of the sectors are probably also different and that needs to be taken account in the, de in the decision. So crazy for us to do something if other people have lots of power to do it, but actually in some spaces, really important that we do more, not level playing field, therefore. 
Thanks, Anna. I, I didn't like the policy position statement, I have to admit. I, I read it, and I don't think it's very clear. And it's not quite a non sequitur in the middle of it, but it's, when I read it, I thought it was. Um, because the, word, the, the words, this means that, I mean, it doesn't, the first bit doesn't mean that. It might, that might be a part of what it means, but I just felt that when I read it, I didn't really understand it, I think. And, and maybe that just is a reflection on me rather than the person, rather, rather than on the policy, but I just felt it was not sufficiently clear. I don't know about other, maybe it just, I don't, other people felt that as well or not. Michael? I actually thought the, um, uh, there wasn't a non sequitur. I, th I thought that was clear, actually. <laughs> what, what, what I felt less, less certain about in the book was the last bullet point, which, in order to understand whether an incident is egregious, demonstrates serious failings, um, um, and that there is evidence that it's not being investigated well locally, implies that there is a certain amount of investigation of, because every um, family who's um, had some sort of tragic situation will feel that the situation is egregious, um, does demonstrate serious failings in fundamental standards. So I was concerned about this last not concerned about the last bullet point, because I, I agree with the last bullet point, but whether it was in fact consistent with saying that there's a presumption that we would not investigate um, every incident, because the, those involved in the incidents in the last bullet point, or at least most people would say their particular tragedy um, is such that the last bullet point comes into play, in which case we end up investigating every instance. So it was more that my concern was more the compatibility between um, this means there will not be a presumption and this last bullet point. Because that, as I say, really on two grounds. First, in order to establish whether um, something is egregious and so on, implies an amount of investigation. And secondly, every relative will feel their incident is characterized by what's said in the last bullet point. So those were my, my concerns about the policy position. Um, so Paul um, will uh, make a contribution on egregious stuff and I'll, I'll say something to try and draw together what it is we're trying to do here and how we can combine this. Uh, paradoxically, I think the egregious bit was an attempt to pick up on exactly the point that Anna's raising. I think this is, I don't mean to belittle this, but if this was a job description and this will be all other uh, uh, things that you're asked to do. So it, this was our catch-all without being too... Um, simple about this in terms of those triggers uh, that are above that but um, Paul is the champion of egregious great um, <laughs> well, so, so Dave is exactly right that the that last bullet point is, is, is there as the backstop um, but in, in, in order to sort of be able to implement it as you say because there will there'll be many people who will feel that their cases are exactly in that category um, what we're looking at is having a, um, an assessment phase prior to launching the full investigation. So we have a number of people who are very, very effectively trained in investigations that go back, for example, to our healthcare commission days um, and other bodies as well. Um, and they would, um, the idea was that they would look at different cases on their merits and look at these triggers and say which, if any, are tripped on a review of the data, on a review of discussions with inspectors from other parts of the system, so that it wasn't a full in, in investigation, but we had done some work first. Um, without going too far into the governance of that, we think that's important that that goes through the executive, but it's also we think, something we think uh, non-executives might want oversight of as well. Um, in terms of the different sectors, what, one of the 
pieces of work that was done to arrive at the policy position was to look at the um, recent changes in case law. I think it's the Antonio case, um, which showed that the legal uh, requirement on a state to investigate um, uh, was uh, could be discharged um, uh, through the coroner. So, in some way, some of the issues that had grown up around this whole question of should we always investigate particularly deaths in detention um, under the Mental Health Act, uh, the, we feel the law has appears to have changed, or the case law has changed, which can Im impact our decision. But that isn't to say that we have to take a de facto, every sector must be exactly equal. I th we think there's enough nuance in the triggers to allow that, um, that differentiation, but if we don't don't think so. We can we can definitely revisit that on the um, on the specific of the wording and the potential non sequitur. I think there is whether it's clear or not. I don't think it adds anything to say this means that. Full stop. So I think we could just take that out. But let's go back as well and say even with that, whether the form of words quite settles it. But the final point I was going to say was to David's holding position and the transfer of some of the functions from, for example, NHS England. One of the things they have been looking at is setting up an investigations branch. This is why it's quite difficult to settle a final position until we know exactly where we are. But certainly we want to be more front foot and feel we can, be, can confidently project what we will, we know we will do and under what conditions. Quick point. So the obvious point is the um, lack of clarity in the roles of other statutory bodies as just discussed. And clearly that's a, that's a big issue. Um, I, I thought that this looked fine as a way forward, as, as a working brief. Um, but I wondered whether or not it might be possible, maybe with other agencies as appropriate, to monitor a sample of those which fall out of our definition, uh, just to see whether or not really, in hindsight, they would have. And I don't necessarily think we should do that. It may be that a combination of us and other agencies who we think are appropriate, depending on their roles and how they're clarified, might think of doing something in, uh, that's uh, appropriate, that doesn't also set up too many expectations amongst the the families of those who are affected. But any kind of casting the net is going to mean that, that it can never be um, cast iron, if you see what I mean, mixing metaphors. There's always going to be something. So I think if we could monitor some of the sample, I think that might help us to move forward with uh, and the other agencies. Well, first of all, just to pick up the Mental Health Act po the point, the, the issue in mental health is that there are about 300 people die every year while detained under the Mental Health Act. Uh, so, they, so this is people who are detained for their health care, uh, detained by, effectively by the state, um, and who then die. So, it, it, so you could argue that there is a very special category of incident which we should take particular responsibility for, or at least, for, at least ensure that somebody has uh, investigated. But then when you look in detail at who those 300 people are, it turns out that most of those deaths are natural cause deaths. Uh, now, that's not to diminish the importance of, or suggest that they may not have been failings in care where, when somebody dies of natural causes. But they are often older people dying of natural causes in settings where, for to, to an extent, technical reasons, they are also detained under the Mental Health Act. So they're not all the same, is the point. They are some very different... It's somewhere there have been serious, potentially serious failings. The patient might have died by suicide shortly after being admitted to an acute unit. There may be somebody on a, in a secure hospital. I don't know whether, Anna, when you said secure, you meant under the Mental Health Act, but secure is obviously a small part of the, the Mental Health Act issue. But So there is quite a big range. And, um, so, uh, and, and clarity on what CQC's role might be. At the moment, we don't have a satisfactory way of investigating um, those deaths in general or even specifically. So clarity about that is important. But what that made me realise in looking at the, 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 the set of the, the bullet points, the set of criteria, um, was that, it, that the, the, there's a level of detail which will make this work, and it's quite hard to see it at the moment. Um, uh, that may just be because of the phase we're at. But uh, testing this, you know, it's easy to read the bullet points and think, well, each of them sounds reasonably correct, but it will only work once that detail is written into it not just because of differences between sectors, but because it will throw up the fact that some uh, cases, even though they might fall outside what seem like sensible high-level criteria, um, those cases need an, inv an, an individual investigation by somebody. So that sense of how does the matrix of potential investigators fit together should be addressed. That level of specificity about the range of incidents that might happen, I would suggest, Needs to be addressed. And even where there is a setting where you would think there's an obvious case for investigation, like 
deaths under the Mental Health Act, there are differences which have to be reflected in how the document is put out. And so I don't want to be too critical because I understand you've got to a particular point and there needs to be further work and further work with others. But it's that level of detail which will make this work and I'm not sure we've got the clarity of that just yet, maybe, maybe for understandable reasons. Um, oh, Robert, sorry. You wanted, no, no, you were just coughing. <laughs> um, David, do you want to carry on? Move on? So can I take from that, Chair, that um, people are content with the triggers, will work on the policy statements, will build in some monitoring, and the further work needs to be that granularity that Lewis has just pulled out, just for, just for clarity. Is that... OK, I'll, I'll, I'll bank that one. Um, uh, third item, um, then, is on covert surveillance. Um, we've consulted on this. Um, Andrea's had a number of um, uh, formal sessions and, indeed, gone to other organisations' sessions and uh, has touched on those in uh, her Chief Inspector's report, and uh, uh, colleagues have pulled this out in questions uh, in previous board meetings. Um, I think the place we've got to in relation to the use of covert and overt surveillance is um, that views are mixed. And um, so what we're trying to do in this report is uh, settle uh, how uh, we should advance this. So uh, the second paragraph is saying that where CQC uses surveillance, it should only use it as a last resort and in extreme circumstances. So that's a CQC when we're acting uh, to inv investigate, to inspect. Third paragraph goes on to say um, that um, what stakeholders want us to do is produce information on, uh, effectively, on how we will view the use of overt and covert su surveillance. So we are proposing. Uh, uh, hopefully for the board's agreement, uh, three uh, recommendations. Firstly, the point about how we will use it. We will only use it as a, a, a point of last resort and in extremely rare circumstances. It's covered by its own legislation anyway, and we need to be consistent with that. Point B is that we will publish some information uh, to providers and to the public about uh, the use of overt and covert surveillance. And that will be informed by the principles in the five bullets at the top of page five. Uh, again, I'll not repeat them, but the issues about providers need to take in play, uh, account the capacity of people, there needs to be consent, etc. And then uh, finally in C, uh, that the use of uh, covert surveillance by CQC and the information we publish for providers and the public is applicable across all the sectors we regulate, i.e. we're not going to distinguish between adult social care and, um, and uh, health care. So um, what we're asking through this report, David, is um, that there will be further work to be undertaken on this, but that's the principle that we've got to as a result of the consultation. So, in effect, we're saying we will use our powers uh, as appropriate, but in extremely rare circumstances. And we're going to adopt what is effectively a neutral position and saying, if you providers are going to use these, these are the issues that you must take into account. And they're the bullet points at the top of page five. Uh, but we're not going to advocate that this should be used. We're taking a neutral position, I think, uh, is the best way to present this. So, um, uh, the report's asking for you to note that there is further work to develop that document that will go out, which will uh, uh, state what our position is. Um, and in, uh, whilst that work is being undertaken, I'm inviting the board to agree those recommendations. Andrew, did you want to add to that before we open it up or not? Uh, no, I mean, I think that David's covered it, so I'm happy to uh, okay. uh, respond to any comments or questions. I felt a bit uneasy reading this, actually. Um, I thought this, this is a very important issue, and for us to take a neutral position on such an issue that matters so much to the public seemed a little bit, a little bit weak, um, as if we were handing over. You know, we, we're going to focus on something that's quite narrow, which is covert, covert surveillance by CQC. That seems to be our top concern. Um, and actually, this is about covert and overt uh, surveillance by um, the sector as a whole. Now, it may just be that it started off in about covert surveillance by CQC, and that's giving the wrong impression. But um, uh, we then seem to hand over to, to everybody else the decision-making, even though we've looked at the, uh, the issue. 
And I can see why we might not be able to recommend uh, surveillance, because maybe the evidence isn't so clear. Um, but I think we can do more than adopt a neutral position. I think we can um, uh, be clear about what we expect the benefits to be um, and, um, and reflect public concern as to why, they, why, why does the public think that covert surveillance might be needed at all. Uh, and I, I, maybe I'm misinterpreting your, what you mean by a neutral position, but, it, but um, unless we reflect that public concern, which has raised this to a very important issue for a no number of people, um, unless we can say something about the potential benefits and where they might be applied, and therefore when it might be a good idea, that might be consistent with an overall neutral position, but it would be saying when it would be good, um, then I think we will look like we've sat back a little bit from something that matters to people. Um, my personal view is that, um, in some, that the issue is not really covert surveillance by CQC. Um, the, the issue is um, whether overt surveillance by CCTV will actually help preventively. That seems to me to be the likeliest thing. So not that I know people are concerned about putting in a slightly shaky hid hidden camera which picks up wrongdoing, and that may well work, but it's more likely um, that the awareness that people's actions are under scrutiny will make staff behave better and will protect people as a result. Now, we should be prepared. If we, uh, we, uh, if we decide that, <laughs> we may not, but if we decide that, then that's what we should say. And that would um, have implications for what we looked for in measures that care homes might take um, when they were trying to do the best they could to protect their, their residents. Um, I agree that this goes. This isn't just in the end about care homes, because the principle might apply to other settings, and you know, secure mental health units might be might be one, for example. But, um, but uh, I, I won't go on. I, I think we can say more than adopt a neutral position, and then it's over to other people to make them, their minds up. I think that's a slightly over reserved position to adopt on such a contentious and concerning issue for the public. Coming to you, Andrew. Can I just just see if anyone else would like to? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but well, I think it would be helpful to um, distinguish between overt and covert because there are different, you know, there are different scenarios. Um, you know, there are different different sort of legal a legal context for sort of covert. It's it's reaper, isn't it, or something? And uh, overt is is slightly different. So I think we perhaps need to um, be a bit clearer about. That um, yeah, and also to distinguish between CQC providers and families a bit more, because there, again the sort of legal context is is different. I think um, so. It probably plays to the point Lewis's point to some extent in the sense that if we were a little bit more. You know, clearer on what we were saying about the different scenarios, then we may be, you know, it would be potentially a kind of clearer and stronger position. Yeah. Um, I, I think, um, I, I, while I very much sympathise with what Liz and Kay say, I think the trouble with us having a view on whether, on, on the merits of overt surveillance is that. There, there is no consensus. So, um, for instance, were the, this organisation to say it's a good thing in certain circumstances, presumably we'd then be expected to inspect to that standard. Uh, and I'm not sure that, that we're anywhere near, someone will tell me if we are, anywhere near a consensus which would allow that to be thought of as general practice. Um, I do think it would be a good idea to set out what the benefits and disadvantages are. For instance, um, overt or covert surveillance is an invasion of the privacy of the, uh, of the residents, the service users, the staff, the visitors and everyone else. And therefore, to do that, even if it's overt, needs to have a reason. You can't just do it. Covert surveillance, of course, you multiply the, those, that balancing problem even, even more. Which, which, so I, I, I'm not sure I do agree that uh, you, we, we can do anything other than a neutral position, but we need to help people make decisions about it. Um, the second point is about our own use of surveillance. Um, I, and while I think it's perfectly acceptable to say we would only use it in extreme 
or, or rare circumstances, I think it's better than extreme, um, any for, it's suspicion of abuse which can only be uncovered by, by the use, or it's thought could only be uncovered by the use of covert surveillance is, I would have thought, an extreme circumstance. Um, uh, but if we are to use it at all, and I, I imagine there will be circumstances where we would want to, um, then it seems to me we should firstly have a system of governance around how we use it, and we should know what that is at the board. And secondly, we should um, be transparent as we can about the frequency with which we use it. In other words, that um, we need to put in our annual report or, or wherever something about the use of covert surveillance. Um, I completely agree with Robert, actually. Um, and the only thing I would add, I, I, I'm happy with this neutral position, provided that you know the points he made are furthered. And the only other thing I would add is that I think we should probably say how we intend going forward to learn from our own and others' use of this, so that we can have a more fully informed position in, in the years to come. I'm just coming back on no. what Robert said. Mm -hmm. um, all the policies and internal processes would be overseen by the Surveillance Commissioner and um, would be published and transparent in terms of numbers um, through that process. Well, supporting what Robert says, particularly in relation to covert um, surveillance, I think we, I, I would all agree with others who've been a little bit more supportive of, of overt surveillance being um, something which we don't knock back too far. Personally, I think that there may be a lot of technologies that can help providers provide really good care more quickly um, and safely to people. Uh, that And surveillance on an overt basis might be one of those. And it does seem to me that, that the, the language which we're using is negative in that respect. It may be that there's more work to be done to work out how to use it. And we should, then we could say that, but I don't think we should be negative towards this. It's happening in all sorts of uh, other areas of life in a very positive way. Um, and I think we need, we need to be careful that we're not being a drag on it and seem to be Luddite in that respect. Andrea, do you want to give us your views? Um, well, as, uh, as David set out in his uh, initial remarks, um, uh, any conversation that you have about this um, produces a range of views. Um, and that has certainly been our experience, and we've um, had that around the table. Um, so just to address the points that people have raised, um, I think that... Um, what you've got here is a very summarised position um, in terms of what we want to do. Um, and the reason why we're bringing it to the board today is to ensure that um, the detailed work that needs to be done to actually answer some of the kind of uh, more specific points that people have raised, we're kind of doing that within um, a, a direction of travel that the board is, is content with. Um, so I think some of the challenges about, well, we need a bit more detail about this, that or the other are entirely right and proper, and that would be um, our, our intention. I really like the way, Robert, that you um, uh, described this in terms of saying it's about helping people to make decisions, um, because actually I think that is the way that we want to characterise the information that we provide um, for members of the public, people using services, their carers and families, and providers. Um, uh, and so, so the, the two pieces of guidance that we would produce um, would be set in the context for the public, you know, answering the question, why do people end up wanting to use cameras? And they end up wanting to use cameras because they've largely got a concern about the service um, and they don't feel that they're being listened to um, uh, and they're not being responded to. Um, so I think that what, we, what I would like us to do is to um, recognise 
Um, that's the circumstance in which people are making those decisions. What are the other things that they can do? What are the kind of conversations that they could have? Where are, where are the other places that they could go to to get help? And so set it in that context rather than, do you want to use a camera or not? And you know, um, click on this button here and you've, you, you, you've, you, you, you get to a, man, uh, a camera manufacturer who will set you up. Um, so I think we sort of set it in, in, that, in that context. In terms of pro providers, again, I think it is about helping people to make decisions. Um, I can see there are some, there are some benefits um, uh, uh, that, that, that people can ascribe to the use uh, of cameras, but I do not see it as a fail-safe um, for guaranteeing good care. Um, and I certainly don't see it as a replacement for some of the other things that people should be doing um, to ensure that um, high-quality, safe and effective and compassionate care is being provided, like having enough staff, um, getting the right staff in, training them properly, and supporting them to do the job well. Um, so I think that, you know, again, we have to be kind of balanced, really. And, and what we want to be doing is being absolutely clear about the um, issues that we'd be expecting providers to take into account, and which comes to the points that you were raising, Robert, and others um, uh, alluded to around um, people's envision of, uh, of privacy, um, dignity, and respect. So, you know, there, there are there are judgments to be made around this in terms of wanting um, to uh, improve the provision of care and wanting to make sure. Um, uh, that people are doing that in an appropriate way. Um, so I think that what we will come out with in terms of the detail um, would help to address some of the points that, that people have raised. I completely take your point, Jennifer, about um, the evidence base um, uh, in terms of we could contribute to that as we go forward um, because the evidence base isn't fantastically strong in terms of saying, you know, you put a camera in and you get these, you, you absolutely get these um, outcomes, or if you don't have them, you, you, uh, 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 what that, that is. Um, so I think that we should be thinking about how we will learn from others and how we will learn, for example, from the experience that um, one of our larger providers, HC1, is going through at the moment. They are consulting on the use of cameras, consulting with uh, resident staff, um, uh, 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 as well as relatives, um, and, uh, and they've not come to a conclusion of that yet, but you know, it would be very interesting to see what's coming out of that and, and what's happening in other areas. Um, so I think... You know, this is something that you know this conversation will really help us in terms of informing the detail of what we now do um, and and bring back. And I think um, Kay's point about thinking about the different scenarios is how. Uh, I mean, I think that's probably a really good idea in terms of, of as having maybe little case studies in the um, uh, in, in the advice that we provide that gives people some sort of um, uh, t uh, frame of reference for making those decisions. So, um, thank you very much for your help. Yes, sorry, just one one point perhaps for Andrea. If one takes the I don't know if this is the most recent, but I mean the, the case that was brought to our attention, the old deanery, the, the Panorama program. I suppose the issue that troubles me about that is that if the family had come to us before installing the camera and said, you know, we are very concerned that our relative is being abused by um, care staff, you know, we would then have inspected that home but would we have actually been able to, through a standard inspection, be able to pick up what um, the relatives or you know, panoramas filming actually picked up? So I think there's, there's, it seems to me there's an issue here about whether surveillance, covert surveillance um, or overt surveillance can just simply capture events that our inspections, you know, by their nature, just, just can't. Um, so whether there is a more positive, um, and I think this gets to, to Paul's point, a more p positive slant on surveillance is something that sort of troubles me. 
Um, and it, it really is Andrea's confidence, in a way, about whether the new style inspections could capture what, you know, if one takes these particular instance, um, what surveillance has captured. I think I would have more confidence, Michael, but I don't think we can ever say that we would have complete confidence um, um, that we'd pick up absolutely everything, um, and for all sorts of different reasons, which, um, um, as you know, I can wax lyrical for, for hours, so, um, so I, won't, I won't do that um, for the board today. But, um, but I think that our new style inspections, because we're looking very deliberately at the culture of the organisation when we're trying to answer the question, is, is the service well led? Um, <clears throat> will encourage us to get underneath the skin of the service um, and to be much more mindful of some of the um, some of the signs and symptoms, if you like, that would indicate that there's a culture that may um, uh, allow those sorts of things to happen in the main behind closed doors. Um, although, as the um, as the old deanery filming showed, there was there were, there clearly was a culture between some of the staff, which was um, very dismissive of the residents, and um, uh, and so it's possible that that sort of um, uh, that sort of uh, interaction we we might still pick up. And there are some inspection reports that I read. And I kind of wonder how on earth people thought that was the right and proper way to behave, and they knew that there was an inspector in the room. Um, so, so that there are, you know, you know people can't um, necessarily keep up um, a front um, for for all of the time. But I think that's one of the reasons why we we don't want to come out and say we don't want to use these at all you know it's it's a, a dreadful thing to do and we should be stopping it i mean i have had some people say to me that is what we should say um because it feels very big brotherish um and a lack of trust um uh, is is implicated by by making that decision um so we're not saying that um which actually i think is a it is is kind of you know progressing us along a positive, a positive path because we have been invited to say that um, uh, by some of the commentators um, that we've had. Um, but I think that we we need to be making sure that we we have at our disposal all the tools that we we might need to make use of to actually get to the bottom of any particular issue. I'm just going to move to Paul and Lewis. Can I just? just chip in myself just for a minute. It's just the words, as a last resort, inextremely. I mean, the CQC only used COVID as, as a last resort in extremely rare circumstances. I mean, I just wonder whether the words last resort, inextremely, just make it... Do you I think mean, we're, we're over-egging the point yeah. there, David? I, <laughs> you know, I think, I mean, what do we, I mean, I think in a last resort, does someone have to be absolutely being pummeled to death before we do it? You know, I mean, I think it's a question of I'm not sure we're giving ourselves enough latitude. Well, that, I think does that go to your point a bit, Michael? Doesn't it really? That it's not in those time. It, it, there may be a, a broader number of cases than than would be caught in that wording. Just on that point, David, can I can I suggest? I, I don't think we should define the use by how often we expect it to be used. We should be talking about the circumstances in which it. We, we don't know how often it might be necessary to use it, but the it's the circumstances that need to be defined. And then that will tell us in the end how often. Um, if, if I just follow up your point, the, 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 um, the, the neutral territory on this sounds like it is very broad, because the position we are adopting here is a very conservative neutral position. Um, and it's language like that which is, is revealing that. The, you, know, you wouldn't assume from terms like last resort and extreme we, that, that we're actually saying that there may be some benefits. That, and, and that's, I know you're talking about the covert surveillance by CQC, but we are taking a very conservative position on something, um, I mean, the arguments about CCTV, it's something about CCTV that makes people nervous because the, exactly the same things have been said about town centres um, as well, um, and, and now nobody presents those arguments. The, yes, there's no evidence, um, or no convincing evidence, um, but that's often the case, and that's where we need judgment. Um, and... Yes, there's no con consensus. I, I wasn't 100% sure whose consensus we were talking about. The, the public, is it, do we have to do what the, our consultation 
says. I mean, we, we, I think we're allowed to make a judgment about, about this and its potential benefits. And I worry that our conservative neutral position is too conservative. For example, if you take the phrase, um, for the public, the decision to install hidden cameras is for them and the families to make. That seems to me like pushing it away um, and saying we're not going to get involved. That's their decision. And actually, we should be understanding why they might feel so desperate as to want to make that decision. Um, and we should be prepared to help them. Um, and whether that means help them by giving them the camera <laughs> or telling them how to do it um, becomes immaterial. We should help them. And if, in the end, the help leads to covert surveillance, then we're supporting covert surveillance in some circumstances. So um, by all means, let's not come out in favor of it everywhere and covertly and overtly, because these are different issues, and it's a complex issue. But let's not adopt what we call a neutral position, which is actually a reserved and essentially negative position. Um, so I disagree. I don't think it's um, uh, conservative. I think that the reason why we've arrived at this, um, which is part, partly as a result of the, the co-production work, um, but also as a result of the, sort of the policy thinking and quite a lot of the uh, exchanges and discussion um, within the building, um, is because of the difference in circumstances across the hundreds of thousands of people in residential care and in home care. There's simply there's too many different variables at play and there's too many personal views, and most of all, the individual resident, if they have capacity, or the individual uh, person being cared for, if they have capacity, their view. But what we're absolutely not saying is that we wash our hands of it in any way at all. We're saying that we will provide guidance. Uh, there are some things that break the law, for example. There are many things that don't. Um, but there are very simple things, like it, uh, when we talk about people putting in hidden cameras, uh, a panorama, because that was hidden cameras in people's rooms. But one can imagine a situation, uh, situation in which people might not realise they're putting hidden cameras in more shared areas um, for the good of their, or perceived good of their um, individual family member. Of course, that would completely compromise other people's human rights. So we will provide guidance on the appropriate use um, for providers and for uh, members of the public to, to inform their decision. Um, and the second reason I don't think it's passive at all is that we're making a, a statement we haven't previously made about clarity that we will act on the evidence. We encourage people, if they choose, um, whether that's providers or members of the public, uh, to bring that evidence to us so that we can act on it, so that we can, can we use... possibly take a different view from that? that we, the alternative to that is not acting on the evidence. That's not a very positive view. Historically, historically. Lewis, CQC has said we will not use the evidence from video recording in any of our enforcement activity. Now, whether that was a good Paul, thing, or it, should, or <laughs> it shouldn't happen. What we're trying to do we in this... It, no longer adopt what is a failure. Anyway, I don't, I don't, I don't, I think, I, I don't think we should say that's too positive. You know, that sounds to me like an unacceptable position that we wouldn't take evidence when it's presented to us. Um, that, that's such a, a publicly indefensible position that getting rid of it is a good thing, but it's not particularly positive, I don't think. Well, so I think this is a really helpful debate and just proves my... <laughs> no, seriously, it just proves my opening point about it is impossible to get a position on this, and I think we've just demonstrated that for the last half an hour. So I think what we need to do, David, is take it away. Uh, I think we need to embrace the comments that have been made. I bitterly regret using the phrase neutral in my introduction. <laughs> what we were trying to do is pick your way through an argument. Can I just do two things before I uh, try and sum up from the executive team's side on this, David? I first came across this as a baby social work manager in the early 1980s, uh, dealing with a case of Munchausen syndrome by proxy, and where uh, actually it was detected by the use of video surveillance of a mother abusing a child in a hospital. And uh, I think there's a long protocol, and I think there is evidence in your profession, Lewis, in psychiatry around how this can be detected. And what we've not got in this report, um, uh, this was a 10-page report when it was first prepared, and we tried to reduce this in the interest of getting this there. And I think what we've just done is we've just kiboshed a, a whole range of issues that were in the fuller report. And the key issue on Munchausen syndrome by proxy, and, and you would have taken all those kind of things through ethics committees about how you should actually deal with those. And what this does 
in shared areas is it raises the issue about where intimate and personal care is being delivered, what are the, what's the ethics of actually that being recorded when it's by a provider or indeed by us? Robert raised the issue about governance, and I think some of the governance has got to be about the ethics of it, the morality of it. We then take this into working age adult secure units, and that raises a whole raft of issues around um, uh, what should be recorded and what shouldn't be recorded. So I think what we were trying to do, and if that is overcautious and uh, neutral, then I, I use the phrase neutral. It isn't in the report. I profoundly apologise. But there are some really important issues that we need to pick your way through uh, that are hugely important. And I think Michael's absolutely got it, in my view. The issue for us is whether people are using this because they don't feel if they came to us, we would listen to them or act on it. That said, I did a Wave 2 inspection the other Friday. I was in the care home for nine hours. I calculate that to be 540 minutes. That leaves half a million minutes that were not there. So I think there's some really important issues that we need to tease out about what is our position. I think, Paul, I, I just wonder whether neutral and over-conservative and Paul's point about actually technology is going to contribute here. You do need to embrace it and use it positively is how we actually combine the position that Lewis was raising with uh, Paul's point. And I think it picks to the point that Robert is using about what's the appropriate governance about where this is going to be used. I think... Um, those issues about uh, in care homes, are you going to have a camera running in a home which will record personal intimate care of somebody who's incontinent who needs to be ch changed? That, that's one of the questions that we need to bottom, and that's what this guidance was. And in presenting five bullet points and three issues, we've lost that narrative and lost that argument. But that's effectively what it comes down to. You then get into, well, who gets those tapes? Who gets to look at those tapes? Who stores them? How long are they stored for? So the stuff that HC1 are doing, they've got to address that issue. Now, we can think our way through each and every one of those aspects, or we can actually take another view. Have you ever gone to a swimming gala with your kids and actually watch what happens with cameras? Because of nobody wants images of young children being taken and then circulated. And I think there are issues that we must consider as we actually develop this policy. So I don't want to be an apologist to it. I don't want to drop regulation all over it. I don't want to get in the way of technology. We don't want to stop people who are so concerned that this is their only resort from seeking some resolution of their concerns. But I think as a public statutory body, we can't ignore those bigger issues. They're not bigger issues, those other issues around morality. And if we've done a disservice to the board by actually bringing a reduced report, I take responsibility for that and apologise. But we do need to bring that back in its fullness. And that's what a publication should get at. OK, I think it's a good way of bringing that discussion to a close today. I think, it, I think we should bring back the more detailed paper, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Anna, are you, is that OK? We do that. You're gonna... Can I just say one, one mm. tiny thing? I mean, I, I, yes, and I, I think the, the nub of this is that because there's an absence of evidence, we're actually engaged in a philosophical conversation, which means you need to expose, as Robert said, the risks and benefits. But I think the logic for me of hearing the conversation around the table is that um, there are, it seems to me, conditions in which we absolutely would not want to use it, and there are conditions in which we absolutely might want to use it, and there's a very large grey area where it's a matter of judgment and the risks and benefits are very finely balanced. But the thing that's not in here, and I heard you say, Andrea, but it's not explicit here, is that there are some occasions when we would want to use it because it would be the best approach, actually, or the only approach. And I just think being clearer about that, that would be really helpful. Thanks, David. Um, we'll plough on then. <laughs> item four. This is the best 30 minute item I've ever had. But anyway, <laughs> here goes. Um, so, this is the fourth item <laughs> decision, um, and is um, one that um, I hope is um, self explanatory. But um, uh, it's about the transformation programme. We've had a gateway review. Um, and um, a, a first paragraph in italics on page five is um, the Gateway Review, and uh, that's their comments uh, in relation to the review. I draw particular attention to the 
um, six bullet points at the top of page six, which are the recommendations that that review team made following the field work uh, a couple of weeks ago. The conclusion was um, uh, that uh, this work is progressing, but they do think there are work we can do, particularly on this issue about benefits realisation. Just almost to pick up where Anna left that last item off and in, uh, indeed in relation to value for money. They've rated uh, the confidence assessment on delivery at AMBER. Um, David, what I'm asking uh, in this report is that you note this report, and I think the full report and the response to the recommendations should go to uh, Paul's committee, uh, the Audit and Corporate Governance Committee. That's uh, a committee in... March, I think it was, had a full review of the preparedness of the transformation programme, so it will be consistent with the work that they did, that they gave some further deliberation. So I think this is a cautiously uh, positive report in relation to the transformation programme. There are some recommendations which the executive team certainly have accepted uh, in full uh, and uh, have begun to act on since they were made. Um, uh, I'm sure uh, Hilary and other colleagues will be happy to answer any questions, but um, as I say, I, I think it probably needs scrutinising through the Audit and Corporate Governance Committee in some uh, further detail. Hilary, did you want to add anything to that? I'll be brief, thank you. Uh, just to say that this is a, a, a public sector methodology used widely, um, using skilled assessors to give an external review about the delivery deliverability and leading to a rating. The real value for us is in the narrative analysis and recommendations that we take forward. So um, it's, uh, it would be really valuable to use the Audit and Corporate Governance Committee to help us uh, test whether we're doing all of the things, both in the recommendations and the narrative, uh, that will enable us to deliver the transformation that enables CQC to deliver its purpose. So, Paul, will you pick that up at the um, Audit Committee? Uh, yes, we'll certainly do that. I think uh, just to note that the next ACG meeting is until the 5th of November, so that's quite a long time ahead. So I think in the meantime, perhaps we'll try and do something um, in interregular, and, and if perhaps in a month's time we can have an update for that for committee members as to what the recommendations are, where we are, etc., that will give us a starting point and we'll just keep monitoring that up to that committee date. Very happy to do that. Robert, yeah. The question, really, um, d does this review look at at all the impact on staff of the transformation programme, um, or, or is that just not appropriate? Is that done somewhere else? Uh, the report focuses on the way we've put the programme together, the way we're governing it, the way we're um, uh, coordinating planning and driving delivery, and the way in which we're realising the benefits uh, it had some uh, both uh, intelligence and documentation and also interviews and did talk to um, staff and were um, interested in the impact of what we're doing and how we're doing on uh, how staff feel and act. So there is some of that in there, but the focus was more on the, the programmatic approach. All the staff spoken to were senior staff. So the only way they picked up on the impact on um, staff at the front end of the organisation delivering the programmes was through what the senior staff said. But because this is a live issue, I think that went through to them. But they didn't but speak to inspectors, inspection managers. The, the, uh, in fact, they spoke to uh, one of our inspectors and one of our um, heads off. Right, David, thank you. Can you carry on? Thanks. So um, I think we can probably proceed more quickly with some of these famous last words. But um, in paragraph five on page six, I'm just saying the regulations on fundamental standards, fit and proper person and duty of candour have been laid before Parliament on the 7th of July. Uh, fit and proper person duty of candour comes in for the NHS from October of this year. Uh, for all other sectors, it's from April 2015, as do uh, the fundamental standards. Um, the regulations to give us the power to rate services were laid before Parliament on the 11th of July. Um, the key issue here is about uh, how we prepare staff and the Academy are developing programmes, uh, training programmes which will eclipse staff with a knowledge 
in relation to uh, these new regulations. So I'm just asking colleagues to note this item. The following item on enforcement policy, we covered last time at the June board, and um, that document has now gone out for consultation and pick up on um, the regulations that are coming through. Um, uh, they've also been uh, published, uh, the um, regulations guidance was, was published on the 25th of July. So these things are now coming together as the tools that need to support the delivery of our new methodologies. And uh, we'll bring back on that item the final policy to the board for approval. I'll just pause at that point, David. So, um, Orchid View, you've had uh, previously a report uh, on this and you asked for further uh, update in relation to this. So, attached to this report are two appendices which actually take each of the recommendations um, and map them onto the new approach. Um, uh, they do this in two different ways, which is why there's two different annexes. Um, I hope this gives um, the board the detail that they wish to see in terms of what did this mean. I've got an apology to make to the board and, and indeed to any um, uh, relatives uh, who had uh, the family members in Orchid View. Uh, on the very first page, uh, I've uh, referred to this as Orchard View, not of Orchid View, and I can only apologise for that error. Um, that responsibility sits with me. But um, uh, I hope what this uh, annex, the annexes do is give you a sense of the uh, detailed work that is going on in relation to Orchid View. Uh, I'm asking you to note this, but again, David, I'll pause at this point in case there are any questions in relation to uh, the appendices that you've got. Yeah. Question. Have you hesitation. I, I, I noticed that on recommendation 10 at page 3, um, provisions about where there's no registered manor, uh, manager in place, and those are, I think, an escalation of perhaps what was happening before. Uh, but my question really, really is, is this, uh, uh, what are the circumstances in which a place that doesn't have a registered man manager can properly be described as safe? What, what, um, uh, what we've done um, with providers and, and with the um, approach that we took uh, with fixed penalty notices uh, last year was um, to, to give um, providers six months grace um, in terms of somebody resigning and then recruiting and uh, a new registered manager um, uh, 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 coming into, into post um, and registering with us because there's a, there's a kind of process which will take time. Um, but basically we would be looking to make sure that um, there was no gap that was longer than six months. Is there an expectation of sort of other precautions in the you know, interim? In, in the interim? Yes, and, and, and in the main, what, what providers would normally do is either they've got somebody interim coming in and covering that position, um, uh, um, who may well be a manager but not formally registered with us, um, uh, but going through that process, um, or, or would be acting somebody up. Um, so, you know, I mean, I think that we've made a really strong um, uh, set of, taking a strong set of messages out to the provider set to say registered managers um, are absolutely critical. Um, we can see a correlation uh, between an, the absence of a registered manager and um, lower levels of um, compliance in, in, in old speak. Um, uh, and so we know that that's something that we should be pursuing from an adult social care point of view, which is the reason why we um, uh, took the action that we, we took last year around fixed penalty notices, which did indeed encourage people either to um, register or indeed to, uh, to get somebody in post. The other issue um, at Orchid View was also turnover, um, and that's another another aspect um, that uh, we would be looking at in terms of our new style inspections, looking at the um, uh, um, what the staffing turnover is, and particularly in the senior uh, management positions. Um, as a result of um, the approach to medical revalidation, um, 
we need to bring a, an annual report to the board, which is based on the audit of the approach to revalidation. This is the note of the work that has been undertaken in CQC to discharge that responsibility for the last financial year. This is uh, 13 to 14. And during that period, we had no doctors that we needed to revalidate, which is why it's brief and is uh, presented in this form. There's documents that sit behind this. Um, but for, next, for the year that we're in, 14-15, we now employ a number of doctors that will be covered by this. And Professor Nigel Sparrow, who's one of Steve's team, he's the uh, GP advisor in Steve's team, Nigel will take on that responsibility and oversee the revalidation of the doctors that we employ um, where uh, they have no other employment where they're covered by revalidation. So uh, one way or another, all doctors have to be revalidated. If we're using them and they're employed by another body, they'll be revalidated by that other body. For those that we employ and they're not employed anywhere else, it means that we've got to do the revalidation. So what this is doing, David uh, and colleagues, is saying it was a no return for last year, but we'll have to have arrangements in place and we need to bring that to the board for this year, 14-15, and uh, take it forward on that basis. Um, uh, mental capacity, we've previously had discussions, you've asked for an update. What this is doing is just giving you an update on the fact that following the Lord's uh, report on mental capacity, where they made a number of recommendations about um, setting up a new independent body uh, and changing some of the deprivation of liberty safeguards. The government have taken a view that they're not minded to do that. They've set up a working group and uh, CQC are, uh, are parties to that working group. In the meantime, um, mental capacity and deprivation of liberty safeguards will continue to be a significant part of the inspections that we undertake across all sectors. So I'm asking the board to note that. The Information Governments Committee, which is a subcommittee of this board, uh, Paul chairs this uh, uh, on our behalf, have actually undertaken some work where they've been looking at reports and the use, uh, of what those reports, inspection reports say about the sharing of information. And um, they're making a number of recommendations which are set out in the report. And again, I ask members of the board to note this. Uh, as we get ready for the uh, uh, election uh, in uh, 2015, um, the formal bits of that have begun with the note coming out from the Cabinet Office saying um, that uh, speaking uh, formally to opposition spokespeople by people, including ourselves in arm's length bodies, uh, we need to have discussion uh, with the Permanent Secretary for anything that isn't routine ba uh, business. Um, so if it's to do with what might a future government do after the election, what this means is we're asked to go through the Permanent Secretary before any discussions take place. That will be operable from October of this year. And then the last issue, well, not the, quite the last issue, if I may, David, um, I'm just asking uh, the board to note an item in terms of changing some delegations uh, effectively from Eileen down to Francesca and Etta. Um, two additional things I wouldn't mind adding. Uh, some good news. Uh, I heard this morning that um, as a result of some work that has been undertaken with the Equality and Human Rights uh, Commission, uh, a bid of, uh, for funding to support uh, the training and development of all of our staff in uh, um, the Equality and Human Rights aspects of our work has been supported. So we're due to receive... Um, uh, £450,000 from the Equality and Human Rights Commission to help us uh, take that uh, work forward. And then just um, a, a brief uh, advert. Um, you remember we had a debate here about independence uh, earlier in the year, and um, as a result of that, uh, one of the outcomes was that we should... Uh, make a presentation, a speech in relation to the nation, nature of our independence. That took place last night at the Institute for Government um, and um, the outcome of uh, not just the speech, uh, we published this pamphlet which is um, about a snappy title of Healthy Regulators and it's looking at how trust and independence uh, are critical to delivering our purpose of um, ensuring people get access to high quality safe care. Um, so we've opened up some of the arguments about the nature of trust and independence in this, and I hope by the end of uh, the board there'll be copies of this that will be available for uh, board members. And if people want uh, copies of the 
speech that I gave, the presentation I gave, that will also be available. It was responded to by Stephen Dorrell and a senior colleague from Sonia, and I've forgotten her surname, from uh, Witch, who gave a consumer angle to uh, the presentation. So um, that's, that's, the, um, that's me finished, David. Good. Um, um, thank you very much, David. Well, look, we're not going to stop for coffee now. We're much people are desperate. We're going to have to carry on, I think, if that's all right. Um, so the ne next item, um, David, you're doing it again, I think. It is. I think we agreed that we'd try and present this performance report in a slightly different way, with me presenting the overarching messages, and then as we go through the detail of this, I think Chief Inspector colleagues and, and probably uh, Paul and Eileen would make a contribution when it got to all the difficult questions. So um, <laughs> what this is doing is uh, setting out a high-level summary of... Um, our performance during the first quarter. Um, I think the covering report speaks for itself, David. Um, we've touched already on um, the detail of the work for this year and the balancing the work with the resources we've got. Uh, we've touched on the WAVE programme, which is also covered in uh, uh, my report, uh, and the uh, development of the transition programme. Uh, we're about to go into the item on uh, the evaluation from Manchester Business School and the King's Fund on the um, work that Mike has been leading on. So I'm not going to steal the thunder of that. What you've got is a new look uh, report, which is attempting to do two things. Uh, part A of this report is going through the strategic measures um, really attempting to address the key questions about whether there's been an overall improvement in services, our providers confident with what we do, and there's uh, a huge amount of detail in there about the results of surveys that we've undertaken about how providers view us. I'll not dwell on those. I think um, key to our work, and I pull this out in the covering paragraphs in the annex itself, are on page 17, which is the length of time providers have been non-compliant. This is using our old methodology. And uh, I think we've got a different presentation, not of a trend line, but during this quarter of how many services have been non-compliant for uh, whatever the period is. And the deep purple colour in the boxes show the numbers that have been non-compliant for more than two years. Chief inspectors are pursuing uh, those uh, individual cases to ensure that everything that should be done is indeed being done to make sure that uh, appropriate action is uh, being taken. Following uh, paragraphs, uh, pages, sorry, are in relation to uh, complaints um, about CQC's performance, uh, the numbers that we've got, and... Um, and then uh, slide 19 is really about, uh, are we a, a safe and caring employer? This covers grievances, disciplinary action, etc. What um, the next section does, uh, uh, part B, is it goes through the key performance indicators, and this is much more granular, uh, much more detailed about the number of inspections, and this picks up on uh, some of the earlier discussions um, so on pages 23, we've got the inspection programme. You've already had a snapshot of those figures. Draw particular attention to uh, page 24, which is our enforcement action, which is down on the same quarter last year, uh, just to draw out that particular point. And um, we are uh, considering that. 25 has the issues that we've previously raised about SOADs. Uh, you can see uh, the progress against the plan uh, there. Uh, colleagues have previously raised the issues uh, in relation to that. 26 and 27 is, oh, or 26 is the performance of the National Customer Service Centre up in Newcastle and um, just gives you some volumes and numbers in relation to their activity. Uh, this is all activity which is up on previous years. Um, in terms of uh, people, um, 27. Um, You've got some sense of um, um, the numbers of people that we've got, turnover, staff sickness. This does play to the workforce um, and the impact on the workforce. Some of those figures um, are increasing, and as uh, you, we've already discussed, vacancies are at a high level. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on uh, 28, 29 um, 
and uh, 30. We've covered those in the transformation uh, programme so far, but there's more detail there if uh, board members wish to uh, challenge and interrogate those issues further. And then on pages 31 uh, onwards, there's uh, detail around finance. What you've got on 31 is an overall financial summary. It goes into some detail about performance. Uh, importantly, and this is new and different on page 32, you've got the run rate. If that level of spend continues towards the end of the year, what would we expect to be in, uh, in our outturn position at the end of this um, financial period 2014-15 is really what the run rate is attempting to uh, identify. Um, and then that's all drawn together in the financial position and forecast on page 33 and uh, what follows on page 34. Um, page 35 is procurement and um, these are the contracts that we're buying and again uh, I think what we wanted to do in this is make sure that there's a regular report on procurement uh, the procurement that is taking place, but also what the top valued contracts are that we've got that are extant at the time, and they're captured on page 35. And then finally on page 36 is the capital budget. Um, I, I'm just not quite sure about one phrase, which is the third arrow down on the capital programme about whether it's projected that all of the capital budget will be utilised. I think what we've got on capital are proposals that can be spent. They only become plans when those proposals are worked up. And I, uh, what I'd want to draw the board's attention to is uh, the proposals that we've got haven't yet been converted into plans and I can only give you some degree of confidence that we'll use all of that capital budget when those proposals do become plans. And I think we've just got to get better in our discipline of reporting to you about the difference between somebody's idea of what they'd like to do and uh, a proposal and when it's a plan which says this is what we are going to do and this is how we're going to do it and how much we'll be committed to doing it. And then the last um, uh, information I draw attention to is the strategic risk register. Um, there was recently an audit and corporate governance committee. I think Paul has got a report later in the agenda for noting, and they considered this at their meeting. Um, so that's recently been reviewed by some colleagues on the board, but not by all. So I hope that's given you a sense of what's here, David. It's a new way of reporting. It's the first time we've got this degree of detail in this new style of reporting. Um, but uh, I'm happy to answer the easy questions and pass the difficult ones on to others. Good. So I think questions just on uh, any question arise from the figure, but also whether people f feel we've captured the right information in this report will be helpful as well. But, Lewis. Uh, well, first of all, I think the report is really good, actually. Really, really helpful. Very informative. Um, and just what we uh, need to get into the further detail. Obviously, then the question is, well, what lies behind what's in the report? But uh, that's not to <laughs> ignore the fact. I think this is, this is a really helpful um, uh, sort of item for the uh, you know, way of presenting data to the board. Um, it's full of interesting things, but can I just pick uh, and say a, a brief word about, about three? Um, one is the, the issue of um, uh, how long providers can remain non Sorry. One is page 17, the issue of how long providers can be non-compliant with standards. Um, so I'd say that stands out as the sort of troubling element to, the, to what's in the report. So it would be very useful to, to, to hear what uh, lies behind that, what seems to be a, a persistent uh, failure to meet standards which we expect um, and what now will be done about that because I think we would all I guess nobody would disagree with this that, that sounds like an unacceptable situation from a, uh, a sort of uh, public point of view um, secondly going slightly backwards the um, the second th question is about find the page on page 14 um, Yes, I'm sorry, David, I will have to mention fo uh, false negatives and false positives. <laughs> but the, the, I mean, the, the numbers are quite small at the moment, so you, you wouldn't want to draw too many conclusions from the numbers on, on that um, uh, chart. So this is, where, this is the one where the intelligent monitoring band 
turns into a rating on inspections. That's, that's the one I'm referring to. Uh, and um, uh, the, the, But the bit that we would have to keep under close scrutiny is what's happening to the ones which we think are okay. So that, so that's the fault, that is the false negatives issue. So people who are, that are not being highlighted as troubling trusts, um, but and therefore we think they're low priority for inspection. Um, and depending on what we think we're identifying here, either one or three of the four uh, turned out not to be good. Uh, they, they were less than good. Now, there are only four of them, so it would be ridiculous to turn this into a major issue, but um, obviously we will have to keep a close eye on that. Um, I'm not so reassured that 19 of 26 were in the band that we thought they would be based on the intelligent monitoring. The, the more important issue is how many do we think are low priority but actually turn out to be less than good uh, because that means our initial wave, our sort of screening, if you like, is not picking up um, the, the potentially uh, dangerous trusts to the right degree. And bear in mind that we're, we're highlight we're, this is a selected sample. So once you expand bands four, five and six to the correct proportion, that would probably mean that there are more, um, numerically more uh, inadequate trusts in our low priority band than there are in our high priority band for inspection. Now, I don't want to labor that point because it's based on such a small number, but just to, uh, that's just to emphasize the potential seriousness of not getting the false negatives down to a minimum. And then my final point, just very briefly, is on the public trust of CQC. Um, that's a, it's, um, it's a very interesting question, um, and, and what it's uh, based on is also would also be interesting to know. Uh, but um, the, 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 the middle result there in that chart, so this is question, this is page 12, the, um, do you think CQC um, is on the side of people who use services? 60% say yes, 40% seem to have said either no or, or not committed themselves. I think this does raise a question for me about, about what we are communicating to the public about our, our actions and where CQC is taking the right action and decisive action. I'm not sure we, we at the moment, are getting that across. We, CQC tends to be, uh, have a public pr profile when something has gone wrong, usually historically, um, and we, we probably need to be better at what I see as a board member, which is um, the actions that are taken uh, when uh, problems arise. I don't know whether we're, we're doing as much in that public-facing side of our responsibility in a way which would improve public confidence in what we do, but also ultimately in the services that they might receive. So more, more I think, on what we, what we present to the public about the, um, the good work that, that, that's done here. Can we try and pick up those three? I don't want to lose them as we go through. I mean, Paul, do you want to pick up the middle one on the um, false negatives? Uh, yeah, but I think Mike will also have some, some things to say. Um, it, it, it does pick up on the earlier conversation and the points that you've raised before, and 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 it's and it's right. It, it doesn't intelligent monitoring doesn't simply doesn't pick up everything, and it does have some false positives and it does have some false negatives. Particularly looking at the um, uh, the bottom uh, set of uh, bars, the bands five and six, um, that then turned out to be inadequate or requires improvement. I'm pretty sure the inadequate is more can be, isn't it, um, Mike? Um, and it's worth saying sort of two things. Out. Firstly, um, the reason we picked um, the, uh, some of the uh, hospitals trust to go into was because we had other information beyond the tier one, beyond the comparative data that we can publish in intelligent monitoring. Um, but we, knew, we thought there were other things going on. That's why we prioritised it. So what it absolutely isn't um, is a, um, um, a fair sample of ones that we thought were fine but turned out not to be. We didn't think they were fine. It's just the reason we didn't think they were fine. Uh, wasn't in the first tier metrics of intelligent monitoring. It was picked up through other parts of intelligence. Um, and the other thing to say is that um, because we use that first tier of in, uh, indicators, because they're the most robust, they also, they also tend to be the most lagging, so they also tend to look back in time. Um, so if memory serves, they were banned, uh, Morecambe Bay was banned five for the, um, the latest data we had available, which was October 2013, compared to when we went in, which I think was January or possibly February, um, about that time. Um, but by the time we'd got to the March publication, uh, which was using data obviously more up to date, uh, they were already in band three, so if you like, the top half of risk. So I certainly wouldn't want to leave the impression that they intelligent monitoring and or 
our knowledge of what was going on in those trusts was, was nil or uh, thought it was all fine until we set foot on the, on the hospital site. Um, but I think that you make the point very well that we have to keep looking at the false negatives and we have to keep just bearing down on it and changing our metrics and learning which ones are the ones that most predict and to keep going. I'll add to that or not. But very briefly, this is precisely why I made the intervention mm. earlier, um, that, that we, we don't only go by uh, uh, the intelligent monitoring. I think we did choose these other hospitals because we, we had concerns. And so that is, that is the soft intelligence, the, the tier two or other intelligence that we get. Um, and uh, so just for, for information, uh, Paul's identified the inadequate as being Morecambe Bay, um, and the two requires improvement are Cornwall and Peterborough that we have, um, uh, but we had concerns and we went in. The two issues that um, Lewis raised, just on the enforcement, the people that have been had enforcement actions outstanding for over a year, and it's mainly, it's mainly you, I think, really. <laughs> Andrew. That's, that's one of those difficult questions that David was passing over. Um, um, <laughs> no. um, so, uh, what I, I want to say t two things about that, um, and I also wanted to pick up the uh, uh, the final point that Lewis made as well, um, make a contribution on that too. Um, so, on on those those services. We are looking at them uh, uh, proactively and making sure, as David said in his introduction, that um, all the all the right um, action is being taken. And uh, there, there may be some data cleansing issues in there um, in terms of making sure that it's absolutely accurate, and so we'll pick those up. Um, there are some that continue to be non-compliant in the areas that we've identified. And there are others, um, uh, the majority, I think, um, where they've been non-compliant on one issue, they fix that issue, we go back in and they're non-compliant on a different issue because the focus um, ha ha has changed. And this is where I think that the, the way forward, particularly um, in adult social care around our new style inspections, looking at the five um, key questions and particularly looking at the question of whether the service is well led, um, will help us to identify those services that really need um, added extra effort um, to sort themselves out, um, um, which is the reason why we'll be working to develop um, a special measures regime um, for adult social care um, uh, uh, from October onwards, once we started rating um, services as inadequate, requires improvement, good or outstanding, so that we can bring that in um, from April uh, next year. In the meantime, we are continuing to pursue um, the uh, enforcement action in terms of warning notices and making sure that we're using the full spread of the powers that we've got, in particular the ability that we have um, to restrict um, uh, people's activity if that's required. Um, so, for example, restricting um, nursing care um, if um, the concerns that we've got are about nursing care and sort of restricting admissions or, uh, uh, or whatever the appropriate response should be. So, um, in Inspectors are well aware of the kind of things that they need to be doing there and with support from Rebecca's team and legal are taking that forward. But I think there are more things that we can do um, and we will be doing as part of the special measures. But to pick up your final point about the communication, um, in the main, when we are um, uh, taking action, um, we will release um, uh, uh, press releases um, to lo the local press because, frankly, that's that's the that's the the, the people that need to know are, are the folk locally, um, uh, and uh, the support from Paul's engagement team in terms of the regional um, uh, press officers are actually very proactive in doing that. And so, for example, one of the um, one of the uh, areas where we have taken action very recently which is Foss Court in Harrogate, um, you know, that, that we, we issued press release that was followed up and picked up by the local press. Um, and, and we've also had now supportive comments in, in, in the local press from the local MP about the swift action that we've taken there. Um, so, so we do 
try in terms of getting those messages out. Um, uh, there may be more that we can do, um, but as we all know, we're not the ones that write the newspaper copy. Um, and so you know, we, we need to be making sure that we're doing that proactively. But obviously, um, uh, there are colleagues like Will in the audience um, uh, who, are, who are responsible for putting pen to paper. David, can, do you mind if I just follow up very briefly? That? First, just to say we could use our, we, we don't write the newspapers, but we do write our own website, so we, we could make more. And I, I, I've made this point before, but, but um, board members know that D David Bean sends a, a note round every week as to what actions have been taken. And it is, I, I often think it's quite an impressive list of things that CQC has become involved in and taken action on, quite decisive action at times. And uh, that isn't. It doesn't seem to me that we don't we don't make enough of that uh, as to re. I mean, it's not just about our public image. It is about reassuring the public that poor care will be sort of tracked down and acted on. Um, and just very briefly on the two, two year, I mean, there must come a point, mustn't there, where just continued non-compliance in itself is the offence, um, and there ha therefore has to be a limit. Uh, uh, even though it might be changing, the the real issue, the, the you know the non-compliant point might be changing. It has to be a point where we say, right, and this is it. This is the time you've reached the time limit, and you still are not compliant. Yeah. And and that is um, one of the absolutely clear benefits of the special measures um, regime that we will be introducing. Is where we'll be absolutely clear about the time scales get, that get applied there. Um, I'm, I'm sure you're right, Lewis, about the the our ability to make more of what we're doing. There are, of course, occasions when we need to be taking that action um, uh, in a way that actually we can't publicise because of the kind of legal proceedings that we're going through so um so there is a balance there to be to to, to be um uh, met but I'm, I'm i'm sure we can talk with chris day um uh, about that further Jennifer. quick point i just wondered if there was a pattern in the standards that the types of standards that people were not responding to uh, were not compliant with over a long period and whether or not that met there is some issue about uh, therefore whether some of the standards themselves are need to be revisited? Um, I'm sure that we can get a, an analysis that, that kind of looks at which of the um, regulations. Um, I'm looking at Paul to uh, to see if he's nodding at me, and he hasn't yet, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I hope, I, I'm sure that we could do that. Um, there's one point I'll come back on. Yeah, a delayed nod. Um, yes, firstly, Will. Uh, secondly, it's, it, it doesn't mean it's the same standard at all that's being breached for the totality of the time scale. This is non-compliance by location, so it's quite possible there may be medicines management, which was an initial problem, um, that they trust them, or the Friday then puts that right, but they slip off on uh, staffing. Uh, we would continue to register them as non-compliant. Uh, and thirdly, we'd totally overhauled all the legislation anyway, so we've got the different fundamental standards rather than the central standards. But we will go back, there's overlap. We can go back and check which ones are particularly flagging. Can I just say, I've asked my heads of inspection to give me individual reports on all the ones for the hospitals. The numbers are quite small, so we're going to go through those and look individually at what the reasons for continued non-compliance is. Can I introduce a couple of new issues? We, yeah, so, so um, I, mean, I, I, I also thought it was a really great report. Did you want to answer something? Sorry, can I just come back on Lewis's point and just to su supplement uh, if we're going to move on? Uh, sorry, Anna. Um, so some of the other things we're doing, Lewis, on the non-compliance bit, you asked it's not acceptable, it isn't acceptable, and there'll be lots of different reasons behind why we've got to this position. Some of it have been teased out by questions. Others will be actually it's more work to find something non-compliance and take action. And therefore, if we've got pressure of work, then people perhaps are incentivised not to do the right thing. So we just need to be really transparent about what might be contributing to this and get at it. So what are we doing? We're doing two things which I think are designed to make a difference to this, in addition to the chief inspectors reviewing those that have been non-compliant for a long time. Um, we're introducing uh, enforcement advisors as part of our structure across all three inspection directorates and these are people that will have knowledge and specialise and be available to their colleagues to give advice on enforcement. How do you collect the evidence? What do you need to do? How do you take it forward? And each of the directorates will have that capability and capacity. Rebecca's building a team within uh, our legal services uh, section that will actually specialise in enforcement. So what we're saying is this has been 
stubbornly stuck at 5%. If I can remember the figures from the time I was at CSCI, I think it was at 5% then. So there is something in the nature of this beast that uh, enforcement has been stuck at that kind of level. Um, I think we can guess and hypothesise at why that might be, but uh, by actually targeting some additional resource, we hope that we're going to uh, raise um, our performance in relation to this. So um, I would uh, anticipate that if those measures are successful, these figures should start coming down. If they're not successful, we need to look again at what more we need to do and what we need to do differently. But it can't continue at this level. I think you're right to connect it to that issue about public trust. If we're on the side of people stamping out bad practice and we've had bad practice going on for more than two years, then there's a discontinuity in that logic. It doesn't hold together. So uh, more than just what we do on uh, the website, we need to bottom this issue. Thanks very much. So um, I, I also thought it was a great report, and you can tell a good report when um, uh, you, you get it, because it, it means you ask a couple of questions, so you can be more targeted, which is great. So <laughs> thank you. Um, I, and and, and I, I was interested in the uh, time uh, 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 issue that, that Lewis raised too, but I two others I'd just like to raise. Um, one is on uh, um, slide 16. So this is the inspections genu genuinely informed by people who use services, the public and the staff. So it combines the staff and the um, public and service users. But um, uh, and, and I mean, we can see in the report we've got later on on the agenda that there's been um, a lot of work gathering feedback from staff about their involvement and so on and a lot of emphasis on that. I, I remain um, really quite un. Uh, I, I lack of this green. I, I lack confidence in this green. Um, I, I, I just think um, we are, this, this, this is a potential recipe for um, uh, us being a little bit complacent about this aspect. I don't think we have properly focused our attention on it yet. Now, I know we'll do a paper in, in September, but, but, but what I'm hearing from Local Health Watch, which is reflected in a different slide in the pack, um, is that actually they don't. Uh, uh, have trust and confidence in the public engagement that's going on around uh, uh, the CQC inspection regime. And I think we all know that the tool that we've currently used is the tool that was uh, inherited from the past of the kind of the public meeting, but probably not the best and right way to go about getting the public as opposed to a set of people with a particular set of issues uh, that they want to raise uh, with us, which is still important to hear, but, but not about... Uh, that, that kind of quality of public engagement. So I just, that green, I just wonder whether, whether it's right. Um, and then um, my second question uh, is on, uh, on the finances, on page 31, so on the summary information. And I just, ju just want to ask a question, test um, uh, 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 in respect of the forecast, really. Um, so uh, if my understanding, if I've understood this correctly, the primary uh, source of underspend is uh, um, staff costs. Um, it would be normal that if you underspend in a quarter on staff costs, that actually that represents a real reduction in uh, 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 expenditure because rec sort of you don't you don't then spend another quarter's worth on on those staff. You just you have three quarters worth of those staff if you manage to recruit more. So. So if, if the primary reason is a shortfall in staff costs, it seems to me the reforecast actually should reflect that we won't have those expenditures unless it is the case that you um, anticipate new and unforeseen expenditure to remedy the fact that we didn't recruit the staff in the first quarter. So I just want to test that proposition. Can I just shortcut the last question? You're absolutely right to raise this, and there will be a detailed reforecast done for the next quarter, when the because I think we are we're not going to catch up, Anna. You're you're right to raise the issue, and there will be a reforecast done. So, so can I can I just ask a, a related question then? Because uh, by the time we see that again at the end of the six month period, I my understanding is that there will also be a departmental six month uh, a Department of Health uh, six month uh, review of arm's length body expenditure, um, and and there's some there will be some. Uh, pressure at the six-month point uh, um, to be uh, not only very clear about the um, uh, forecast position, but but also potentially to uh, recoup to the centre some of the underspend. So actually, that six-month position is going to be very critical for us 
and 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 it's three months away, but we haven't we haven't got the information uh, in front of us today. So I just just delicate <coughs> moment really. Ireland. Um, I think you're right, absolutely right, Anna, to to raise the the issue of what this presents. Um, I think there are two things. The, the mid-year review with the Department of Health, um, the discussions to build to that are happening already in terms of um, what position will we show at month six, what will the outturn be at the end of the year, and then crucially, what will the activity and the resource required in 1516 to deliver to the plan that we were talking about earlier. So although, of course, there is discussion about recouping to the centre, there's also a very realistic discussion about delivery by CQC to plan and an understanding of the resources that we require to do that. Um, what um, we will find uh, as we move into quarters three and quarters four is that, A, new people will come on board, um, so the, the pace of recruitment will pick up, so we will see some of those costs coming in. So the, the actual profile of the cost changes month by month. You'll understand that. And the other thing to note is that because, um, as Andrea rightly noted, there are more inspection days happening than there were last year, um, what we're actually doing is deploying um, bank staff and to some extent also paying overtime. So we'll see that coming into uh, some of our figures also. So what we're going to see is that the run rate of expenditure is going to increase. We'll be forecasting that carefully. But absolutely critically, the discussions with the Department of Health are framed in terms of the activity that we have committed to and the resources that we require to deliver it and the plans that we're putting in place to, to realise those resources. So um, I think it is very realistically framed against activity. Anna's first point, um, which was on page 16. Have you got a comment on that? Just on 16, the financial 16, the financial risk section is really trying to capture that argument. And um, so if you want something circulating daily to the board before September, I'm more than happy that we actually do that. When will you have a re-forecast done, Eileen? The re-forecasting is happening during August, uh, David, so um, the, the most sensible time to do to actually bring something forward is, is the beginning of September, once the re-forecasting and the analysis have been done. It, it's not a, a trivial undertaking to, to go back through the directorates to look at what the cost profiles are and then to be able to re-forecast. So are you I'm happy with that coming in September, then? I think that's a bit rather than waiting for the next quarter. Yeah, OK. So what page um, Anna also raised on page... To, um, 16, that we may be um, flattering ourselves with the Greens on that page. Uh, but <laughs> fair challenge, done. <laughs> There's no science about this. Uh, you're right, we need to be careful of being over complacent. I, I have to say, though, this has taken more hours of the executive team trying to nail this issue on what is it we're going to do and what is it we can afford to do and where do we get value from this than anything. And your question about about the money goes right to the heart of this. So what we will try and draw all this together, and this will come, uh, as you've already indicated, later in the board. So green, well, we're doing better than we've previously done, but probably not as well as we've set an ambition to do. And uh, and um, I, I, your challenge is fine. David, the figures speak for themselves. I think. David, okay. I thought I was say something. Okay. Say yeah. I'm still here. The, um, <laughs> the, I, was <laughs> the um, I think Anna's point is absolutely vital on the patient survey part of it, or the public survey part of it. I, I don't think the num number of 97% people use the services were involved in the inspection is a valid number for primary care. Uh, to be absolutely blunt, um, if you ask a provider whether um, people who use the services were involved. They're going to say yes. That might be n equals one or two. What we're finding when we go round the practices uh, is an improvement on what we thought about the number of patients involved in patient participation groups and things like that. But in reality, if you're looking after a population in a geographical area, I don't think we're sampling well uh, to start with as CQC and I don't think the practices are actively engaging in all of the patients that they serve particularly the vulnerable groups uh, people with mental health issues etc 
And so uh, that's why when we're looking at our methodology for primary care, uh, we're going to do things very differently. Um, we're going to involve Health Watch much more at a local level. When we go into CCG areas, we'll be sampling across not just primary care, but talking about social care as hospitals as well. The danger with a figure of 97 is very similar to the satisfaction rate when you see your GP, which is usually in the high 80s and 90s. If you ask a particular question a particular way, you'll get an answer. Uh, and what I'm really concerned about is how both the services serve their population and how we sample that to get a real view about how the services are doing that. So I'm completely, as usual, with Anna. Robert. Um, back to page um, uh, 17 and the concerns that have really, already been um, raised. I, I, I can understand, particularly if we're looking at old standards, that, that there's a sort of a slight attitude there are standards and standards, and some matter more, more than others. Uh, but experience has shown, hasn't it, that um, tolerance of non compliance for long periods of time is in itself a risk. Of, to safety, and, and I wonder to what extent we are y yet good at distinguishing between what is a real and current risk to the people going through the door or whatever the institution is now, uh, and whether there's still a degree of institutional complacency um, about that indicated by these figures. Do you mean institutional complacency on our part yes. or the part yes, of the providers? Yes, I do. Uh, on the part, it, it's, it becomes a sort of an acceptance that you know, it, this has happened and nothing rock terrible has happened so far. And actually what you're looking at is a period of risk to which people are being exposed because nothing is being done about these matters by the registered organisation. And, and, and that's the kind of conversation that we're having with inspectors, um, in particular about those areas where, the non as, as Paul quite rightly um, described earlier, the compliance is by location and not by specific. So it could be just moving from one to the other and, um, uh, and coming back to what Lewis said earlier, which is continued non-compliance. It doesn't matter whether it's kind of one regulation or another. The fact that you... Um, you're not getting a grip um, of the uh, of the service across the board is an issue for us and is an issue for us that raises um, uh, uh, risk, uh, a level of risk. I think that we have been hampered to some extent by the compliance, non-compliance judgment that we've been making against the regulations up till now. What will significantly help us is the um, focus on how well led the service is, because I think that's how we get the... Um, we look at it afresh, um, which I think kind of helps us in terms of saying we're not just going to accept what we've had before. Um, but uh, it also gives us the, um, uh, the assessment that says, are we uh, confident that there is capability within this organisation either to sustain the good and outstanding service that we see or to make the improvements that are required if we think that it's inadequate or it, or it requires improvement. Because, you know, as David quite rightly said, we might be there for 540-odd minutes um, a, a year, but there's, um, there's an awful other, lot of other minutes that individuals are using those services um, that we're not around. And we've got to be able to get the confidence in the leadership of the service to make sure that they are doing the job that they're being paid to do um, uh, when we're not there. OK. OK, yeah. Um, I'd just like to go back to the um, slide 16, um, which is actually about, um, you know, are inspections genuinely informed by um, people who use services? Um, and I think there's a lot happening and, and, and more planned. And I actually think that um, we should look at, at maybe changing the measures for this, the performance measures, because... What we really need to be asking, we need to be asking patients themselves, experts by experience, local health watch, whether they feel that our inspections were genuinely informed by people's views and experiences. Whereas here we've got providers, which I think, you know, Steve has explained the limitations with that. And then we've got a general one about inspection teams. Um, but that could just be 
uh, a few inspectors. I don't, I don't know. So, you know, um, so I mean, generally, I think this performance report is actually very good. The way that it's all set out, and uh, you know, it's it's one of the best I've seen. You know, it's honest and open. Um, but I, but I think we could potentially revisit the the performance measures on on that. So you know, it actually reflects what um, what it's supposed to be measuring. Yep. Thank you. I think that's a generally held view, actually, that that slide could be looked at again. Paul, you're going to take a different view? No, I think they will do it, because um, there's a lot more to what we do than is presented on here. And as Anna rightly pointed out, to give you an example, if we, were, if we use listening events on the day before we start inspection as the main way to gather people's views and concerns would be in all sorts of trouble, we, we still do do it, and we need to kind of work out that's just a legacy issue. But the fact that we use experts by experience, the fact that we look at the compa uh, complaints and concerns data, the fact that we have all the survey results, and the fact that we do talk to Local Health Watch, and we need to get better at it, means that there's, there's quite a lot of things going on. We really need to test and report on is how well each of those things are going. Thank you. Any, anyone else wanted to raise issue on the performance report? Good. Um, thank you very much. Um, moving on then, I think, Mike, we're on to um, Kieran Walters and the King's Funds report. Yes, I'm not absolutely sure whether Rachel Adcock was going to attend today. I'm, can we just... Yeah, I'll go, Mike. You, you, you. Shall I get... She is. She coming. I don't, no, I don't I, she wasn't. I, she, I just saw that on the yes, agenda so she was down to. I just, in case she was there, I didn't want to... So, I, I mean, the, in, in terms of the Kieran Walsh report, um, board members will remember that we've actually discussed uh, an interim report on this before. This is the, 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 the final re report. We commissioned uh, Kieran Walsh from uh, University of Manchester and the King's Fund to look at our uh, new approach to hospital inspection right from the outset. Um, and really, they looked at wave one and then part th through, through wave two. So, um, <clears throat> and I think it's given us some extremely valuable and independent uh, insights into it. I don't think the report has really told us anything that we weren't aware of anyway, uh, but that's good. Um, but uh, I do think it gives us the independent uh, report. And I think where the, particularly the independent report is, in, is valuable is actually also in finding out what the providers we've been inspecting uh, have to, to think of, of the inspection report, because uh, they, they might be nice to us, um, but I think they would give an independent view uh, to um, the academic group doing the um, re report. Um, um, I'm very happy to go through it line by line or, or not. Um, uh, that you will see that the report is 77 pages before you get on to the um, appendices, etc. Um, and uh, I think probably what uh, we will want to do is focus um, to a considerable extent on the recommendations um, and the, the page before that, so from about uh, the conclusions and recommendations which start on, on page uh, 74 onwards and also we've listed here um, in, in the covering paper for the board uh, what is, uh, is happening in response. So we, we are accepting the, the recommendations and we are already working on them um, and in a lot of cases things have moved on a long way way or already. Um, so uh, just to uh, give you the examples of that, um, in terms of the preparation before we go on site where um, perforce in wave one, we couldn't give people much notice of that. We're now aiming to identify which trusts we will go into um, about 20 weeks in advance. Now, we, we we will always leave ourselves some leeway so that if trusts uh, emerge as concerns, we can go into them sooner. Um, but we'll be, we're starting to plan for which trust we might go into um, for, for this coming January, or almost now. And we've already decided which ones we will do uh, between uh, October and December. So that, that is uh, already happening. That gives us the ability to... Um, first of all, get the, the, the right inspection team members. It's much easier, particularly with clinicians, if we want them to come on an inspection. If they know in advance, they can uh, let their trust know. They, they can then get out of doing their routine clinical duties uh, as long as they've given an, enough notice. So I think that, that helps us. It also gives us much more opportunity to get information from the trust 
um, and to prepare exactly what we need to, to look at. So that, that is, is already in hand. Um, we are uh, working to um, realign the, the data packs so that instead of being just generic by domain, which is how they started, they are more focused on uh, the individual core services. Of course, one of the things that highlights is where even with the acute model, we, there, is, uh, there, is, there are gaps in information. So uh, we, we may have uh, in, information about the trust as a whole, but do we necessarily have information about children's and young people services or maternity services? Um, but part of that will also enable us to go into a trust and and ask them for more information uh, in, in advance. So we're working a lot on what what are the, the pre-inspection questions that we will ask the trust um, b before we go in. Um, we've, we've slightly shifted the inspection round. The listening event is uh, on what we call day naught. In other words, the planning day in the evening. That actually means that we can use any uh, findings from the listening event uh, to inform the inspection itself. It also balances out the, in the inspections and we're, and we're giving people uh, the, the rest day because uh, we realise that these in in inspections are very intensive. Um, we've got, uh, we've done well in terms of recruiting uh, deputy chief inspectors and the heads of inspection. We've already talked today about the fact we need to recruit more uh, inspectors. There's a training programme underway as we speak um, and again the training program uh, has been based around uh, the eight core services and the initial feedback from uh, inspectors who are going on the training program is that they're finding it, it extremely useful um, so um, but we will uh, have more to say on that in, in due course uh, I'm not at all surprised by one of the findings that was in this report about uh, inspectors not being entirely clear which domain a particular finding might relate to. Um, we've worked a lot on that. Sometimes it is, to a certain extent, uh, arbitrary. There are one or two things that we could put into safety or effectiveness, but we want consistency, so we are making decisions about that. And even when the inspectors haven't known about that, we have been able to correct that when it comes to the quality assurance process. Um, and uh, but. I'm glad to say that there are far fewer cases where we're having to shift comments from one domain to another um, as people get used to this. So I, th I think we're, we're doing that. Uh, partly the way we've done that is to introduce more subheadings in the reports, making it clear what we expect to see where, which um, uh, has been welcomed, and the reports are improving. I'm not saying they are where we want them to be, but they are definitely improving uh, as we go. Um, we are aware that we... We really need to focus quite a lot of attention now on the post-inspection process. Um, we, we put our major emphasis to begin with on the, the pre-inspection and inspection itself um, and how we actually get, uh, get as good a report as we can in, in a reasonable length of time. Um, and so all of those things are, are underway, um, which are all things that um, Kieran Walsh had identified. Um, I'm very happy to stop there and then say, open it up to questions. Um, thank you, Mike. Uh, Michael, did you have any reflections on the report? Well, I thought it was excellent that um, Mike and Paul accepted the findings in full. You know, there was no attempt, there was no defensiveness at all. I, I thought that was um, very impressive and to be welcomed. I also agree completely with Mike about the use of um, subheadings. I've, I read the Tem Tameside report, and it made it so much easier to read, to have consistent subheadings, you know, for safety across the eight services and all of the um, domains. So I think that this is a huge, this, this new style of report is a huge Im improvement, and I think will make a difference, actually, to um, to the user, to, I think to, to to people who want to see what the CQC says, they'll now I think have more confidence in consistency and so on. So, um, so I thought that was very gratifying. I think the big issue, obviously, I think all of us are conscious of in the in the Karen Walsh report, is will services improve as a result of our inspections? I mean, that, that is the fundamental question here. I mean, I think it's what they call the intellectual logic um, behind the inspection process. 
course, I don't know what the answer is, but mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, perhaps the most important next step from the report is to um, develop a way of measuring the impact that our inspections um, and our, you know, must-dos and should-dos actually have. And, you know, this could be a case of, you know, the test is the reinspection. I don't know. But I think that's, that's the big next step, because I think everything else in the report, as Mike said, has been taken on board and, you know, also, you know, um, my point that the new style of reports are excellent, or the, you know, um, and a, a very big advance on the original set of reports. Thanks. I thought it was a very good report, and I think it shows the huge progress that um, Mike and his team have made in a short space of time, and also that the, the, there's a way to go uh, still to develop things. Um, I do think that uh, it would be useful for this kind of study, perhaps not to the same extent, but to be repeated in a year's time, just to see where we are with progress. And maybe, Mike, you began to list and uh, some actions taken, which looks entirely appropriate. But again, it might be useful to have a more formal follow-up on that as well. Um, in terms of the overall messages, I just wanted to pick out a few. Um, the first one is on impact, which Mike meant, Mike, uh, Michael mentions. Um, Paul will say, but there is an extensive um, plan, at least, to uh, evaluate the impact of CQC's work in a number of domains, including this one. So there's, there's, there's quite extensive plans for that, which uh, maybe it's important to remind the board at some point that that's going to happen, because it obviously came up elsewhere with the gateway review as well on value for money of our work. Um, one of the uh, other points I wanted to bring out is the... Um, the confusion in the roles of CQC and Monitor that was brought out it's in the follow-up arrangements uh, for uh, improvement, which I think, again, that's, I know that's work we're working on, but that's quite important too. Um, the uh, costs of this initial, initial um, phase of inspections that we, are, we have developed, um, again, we have to. We'll obviously want to revisit that. We may want to scale back as we get more experienced and become more risk-based, which again relates to fees and our discussion earlier. Uh, and the other thing, two other things, I just wanted to say. The other one is the um, risk of challenge as a result of uh, possible inconsistencies in the rating, and that keeps coming up as being quite a loud message. And uh, I think we really ought to chew on that before our ratings go live in a, in a more explicit way than maybe we have done at the board, because I think we're, <coughs> vulnerable, we're vulnerable to that. <clears throat> and on the, back on the impact point, half of the trusts in the survey said they would act on newly identified issues pointed out by CQC which means half wouldn't, uh, and 18% uh, say they are not likely to, re to result in, to produce, that, that the report will, or recommendations will result in service improvements. So I think that's uh, a bit worrying. I don't quite know why they would say that, when clearly the reports and the whole process is so intensive and uh, helpful, um, and it would be good to dig under that uh, as to why they are why they're saying those things. Thank you. Paul, just, you just want to just come back on, the, on how we're going to measure the impact. Um, also, I thought we can bring up a more comprehensive paper on where we're up to and what we're planning. Um, and Jennifer works closely with us on this. Um, I think the board member, there was um, a paper a couple of boards ago that, sort of, that, that set out sort of the hierarchy of impact, starting from the position of people getting better services and improvement and working back to what the connection would be uh, to our work. Um, and interestingly, what we have is a sector-by-sector -sector evaluation programme to try and hit all of those metrics all the way through to our strategic measures in the, um, uh, in the board report. But I can happily bring back a more comprehensive approach. I think it would be good to do that, mm. if you wouldn't mind. Um, I don't know, when, when, can you, when would you plan to do that? In sort of, uh, we can do it at any stage. It's on to say, it'll be, this is what we're planning to do. These are the people that we're contracting with where we're doing it outside. This is why we're doing it right. internally when it needs to be. But we can, just, we can produce that for September or October. Okay, thanks. 
Um, I thought this was a really interesting report and very valuable one. Um, I think it, uh, the fact that uh, providers were really engaged in this was, was and, and their, their positive approach to it, I thought, was really helpful. And there's a huge amount of learning that's going on very quickly in this at pace. Um, and the recommendations, I think, are largely within our gift to deliver on, or the providers to some extent, and they, they may be willing to do so. The one bit which I thought was a bit risky in this, which um, I wondered about, was the uh, use of experts. And there did seem to be an indication that uh, while experts were um, enthralled almost by their being involved in this for the first time round, that, that well, and while many of them said they'd be prepared to do it a second time round or more, uh, uh, more times, that there was a falling off, I think, in with doctors in particular and the more seniority of doctors involved. And I just wondered whether Mike's um, persuasiveness would be <laughs> sufficient to maintain the level of expertise that we need to get in from outside on a, a voluntary basis to keep the, uh, the process running at the level that we want to do that. Yes, I noticed that one person had commented that they <coughs> did it because they were badgered by Mike Richards, and that was in the report. Um, I think I can probably guess who it was. Um, but that, I think, is partly actually trying to get the very, very senior people who will chair the ins inspections. Um, and, in fact, we, I think the key, really, is getting people... Uh, to uh, I know when they're going to be able to do it far, far enough in advance, um, giving them notice. I think there is a willingness to come on these inspections. Um, I think we've had some very helpful and very positive feedback from the recent ex-president of the Royal College of Surgeons, um, Norman Williams, who chaired one of our inspections and then wrote in his own college newsletter about the process very positively. Um, and so I hope that will help us to go on recruiting. I, I think we will go on f using all our channels to find the right people to come on these inspections. But actually, quite a number of people have come back sev several times over um, and have been extremely good. And we're, you know, we are learning wh who we can rely on to get quite short notice, particularly when we need to do urgent inspections, um, which where we can't give them the full six weeks' notice. Um, and the fact that people have been prepared to do that, uh, I think, is encouraging. Um, it, it will always be a, con a concern is whether that that's going to um, <clears throat> fall off with time, but I think at the moment I'm not too concerned about it. Uh, uh, well, it obviously it is a, a good report. It reflects what Kieran said when he came here, I think. Um, it confirms a lot of the positive changes that, that you've made, Mike. I think it's, um, it, it is really a positive um, evaluation. Uh, I think it's good that it mentions this issue of consistency in ratings as a key thing. I, I do think that is still a, a big issue. Um, and because if you remember, we've had a lot of discussions here, very fruitful discussions about uh, judgment versus uh, standardized um, sort of algorithms. Um, and I interpret this report as being on the, side, on the side of trying to standardize how we do our rating. Of course, judgment is at the heart of what is then uh, the, ratings that, the ratings that are then made, but in the end, they have to mean the same in one place as they do in another. And uh, I think the report is pushing us in that direction. I've just got one, one question, if that's okay. And that, that's, it's about this issue of um, the uh, degree of preparation or the time for preparation that's allowed, which I realise I've slightly lost track of because I, um, I thought that we were um, getting a balance of unannounced versus announced inspection processes, which didn't give a lot of time for... Uh, preparation. That was the the point that that they w we would turn up, um, and I've, I've done a couple of um, inspections, but they're under the old system, where I thought one of the strengths was that the inspector just knocked on the door and said, "I'm here to inspect," and that seemed to me, and the staff took that incredibly well, I must say, um, and that, but it was a, I thought that was a strength, and um, yet here it sounds like there is quite a a long lead-in time where people provide us with information going on for several weeks and there's a recommendation where we might make that even longer and but are, are you how long is it what's the average time at the moment that people have to prepare um, and are you confident that we aren't just giving people just a bit too much notice uh, I do remember the days in the universities where we where inspections began in universities where it was partly my responsibility in my university to prepare 
Um, and there were, uh, the people spent their entire time preparing not necessarily the standard of education, but the paperwork um, that, would, that would be presented to the inspection team. Now, that's often what preparation means. It's preparing the paperwork. And uh, that does worry me a little bit. Um, and uh, of course, I know that if we want clinicians to take part and be interviewed and so on, we have to give them notice so they can cancel clinics and so on. I think that's very important. I do accept that. But there is a risk in giving a people a lot of time. And it is noticeable that um, very often we are finding out uh, areas for improvement that they already knew about. Uh, well, they said they knew about, and but although they are admitting that they hadn't taken action or act prompt enough action and so on. Um, but, and of course you could say, well, that's very positive. That means that gives a validity to what we're doing. Um, it also means that the inspections are helping to hasten a process which maybe has got stuck locally. Um, but of course it could also mean that we're being too driven by what they're telling us in the first place. And, uh, uh, and so I just want to make sure that we've got that balance of unannounced, that we're not going to give them <laughs> um, too much warning um, so that the paperwork can drive what you do. Can I come back on those two main points? Announced versus unannounced. All our inspections are both announced and unannounced. Um, we are currently doing the announced first because that gives us the preparation time. We go back unannounced to specific parts of the trust um, and they don't know exactly when that's going to be done. They can't, in my view, prepare for that. And it might be at a weekend, it might not be, it might be in the daytime, it might be um, overnight. Uh, so there's always an unannounced component. Uh, the other thing I would say is, look at our reports. Are we saying that everything is good or outstanding? Um, in other words, even if they have prepared, um, we are finding really quite a considerable number of things that, that could be improved or indeed in some cases are inadequate. So, and I think the other thing, if you just take the methodology, by the time we go and talk to as many people in a hospital as we do, it is extremely difficult. Um, for them to hide things that, that we might not want to do. Now, I'm not saying that doesn't happen in one or two cases that they attempt to do that, but where that happens, our experience is that people start coming up to us on the inspection whistleblowing. Um, and we take that very seriously. And there are a couple of inspections that I've been uh, part of where that has happened. Um, and that always raises alarms. Is the trust trying to control this uh, in, an inspection? Um, have they been talking to their staff? Have they been saying to the staff, please don't talk to you? Because that is very rare. Um, but uh, there are one or two instances I can think of and where we have then commented on that to the trust. And actually, that influences our view on whether the trust is well led. So that, that, that's the un, un, announced versus unannounced. The, the other point you raised about consistency and ratings um, is absolutely right. We've said it here before, we'll say it again. It's going to be the most difficult part to ensure consistency. I think um, we are learning as, as we go about that. Um, remember that an individual trust probably on average gets about 65 to 70 ratings because most trusts are not just one site, they're, they're two sites. Um, and so we're doing an awful lot of ratings on an individual trust. Um, just looked at 11 trusts and between them they have 720 ratings. Um, and, and so um, getting consistency across each and every one of those ratings is not going to be easy. One of the things we can now have, now that we have deputy chief inspectors in place, uh, is the ability to do some inter-rater reliability, and we're just starting to do that, um, so that if Ted Baker or Ellen Armistead has chaired a, a national quality advisory group that I've not been part of, I can then re-rate and see how that is. And I think that's something that we, we need to learn from, because uh, I think that will highlight to us um, where the difficulties are. And, and remember that behind each one of those ratings for each trust, there may be 10, 15, 20 different components that go into a single rating. A&E and safety is one cell on our, our grids, but within that there will be the equipment, the medicines, the records, all, um, what, incident reporting, a whole range of different things will go into our one rating of was that A&E safe. Thanks very much. So um, uh, a couple of slightly different issues. Um, in the um, uh, 
the looking at the conclusions and recommendations third bullet down um, there's a recommend that there's a, a, a reference to stakeholders um, so I, I think the first thing I want to just reflect is that the comments on about stakeholders in this report are extremely narrowly drawn in terms of uh, who the stakeholders are because actually what this refers to are the people who are if you like the subjects of the inspection um, or engaged in the inspection in some way which is uh, a, a quite narrow set and, and, and I think there is something um, that we should put on uh, uh, our kind of forward plan about um, understanding what the wider set of stakeholders at the local level um, uh, think and uh, 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 um, understand uh, from the new inspection regime because I think their trust and confidence will be hugely important their kind of ongoing um, engagement and one of the reasons why I think that will be hugely important is because even these stakeholders who are in hospitals said at the bottom of that bullet that, the, that there were some underlying concerns about the costs of the process um, and in the next bullet um, the report talks about uh, uh, the sustainability or perhaps lack of sustainability of the very large inspection team model and and there are um, as we know very big cost implications there so 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 I think this report raises some important questions about um, uh, if you like value value for money um, and stakeholders this limited set are also raising those questions and I think that's important because actually when I've talk to some uh, wider stakeholders, not least Local Health Watch, but not only Local Health Watch, about this. I think there is this absolute sense in peop uh, uh, amongst people that what, what the CQC is now doing um, is, sig is significantly better than what, what was there before. So there is an increased confidence in, it, in, 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 in the approach. But there is also um, an increasingly kind of um, the increasing set of fables about the scale of some of these uh, uh, um, uh, teams. So, you know, I hear people say to me, did you know they had 80 people go in? And we, we know where that was. But so, so there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a sort of uh, popular storytelling going on about the costs of CQC inspections and the scale of them at the moment. And at a time when there, as we know, will be increasing pressure, um, downward pressure on costs. There's, there's a little bit of incredulity about that at a local level. Um, so there's a case to be made. And, and that's, again, why I think these local stakeholders are really important. We need to kind of understand them. But we also need to have a really good story to tell about, uh, um, uh, in the loose sense at this stage, because we don't have the hard wired value for money, but the kind of the, 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 the reasons why we're doing it, the reasons why we're doing it this way, and the downward pressure that we will apply uh, on, on, on the costs over, over time, as I believe we should. And I think if we don't um, uh, start communicating um, those kinds of messages, then the, the, the sort of popular uh, 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 stories will, will, will take over. Um, it's certainly true for Local Health Watch, who, 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 um, uh, who need to be persuaded that this is, um, uh, I mean, they think it's a better way, but is it yet the right way? And is it, it, is it uh, an un, unnecessary or inappropriate uh, set of expenditures or the scale of the expenditures? So I just think there's a communications issue and a stakeholder issue for us in this. Um, seem, seems to me, firstly, obviously, it is a very good report, and, and there's a huge amount in it that's uh, very encouraging. In particular, that um, this new method of inspection um, is so much better, and we confirm to be so much better than what preceded it. But the underlying concern here is clearly about sustainability. And what worries me, and I think we just need to address, is, is n not actually to change what we we're doing before we worked out what bits of it work. The, the recommendation here is about using smaller and ex more expert teams, and I quite understand why that's being said. But that implies a, 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 a sort of narrower focus, which again is understandable. But until we know how to undertake that focus, it would seem to me that would be a risky road to go down. Uh, the other comment is is the. Uh, 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 absolutely uh, right one that it may be necessary to find new ways to enable full-time staff in the NHS to contrib contribute more and that I do worry about as a challenge because as financial stringency hits trusts they're going to be decreasingly willing to release people for this important work uh, and 
when I looked at um, the idea of peer review in this and other contexts, it, it did seem to me that uh, there is considerable scope for the use of this sort of activity as part of professional development, as part of overall training and so on, and, and to, to come out of or, or that sort of budget, and I can't be more precise than that because I'm not, not in, in the field, but um, I, I would like to think that some work is, is going on between this organisation and the rest of the system to work out how this work, which is very valuable for the individuals and the services from which they come, as well as it is for the public, can be sustained. Uh, yes, that, thank you. Um, completely agree with you, Anna, that stakeholders need to be set broadly in terms of uh, who we're asking about our, our inspections. Uh, but both Anna and Robert have raised uh, the, the sustainability issue. I think it is uh, worth remembering that the total cost to the NHS of the sector that I uh, inspect is £67 billion. Pounds. Um, I think if we look back at the report um, th th earlier that we looked at, what was there for hospitals, I know this, I also have strong support from strategy and intelligence, but um, is 26 million. So 26 million versus 67 billion. We know we're not spending a huge amount uh, on, on this uh, ex ex um, endeavour in comparison with the size of the sector that we are um, inspecting. Um, I absolutely agree with you, Robert, that we shouldn't change what we do before we fully understand it. That we should be able to change it in due course. We may well be able to do, to do so. Um, but there are also uh, those who would argue that we should have more clinicians and more do both doctors and nurses on our inspections so that for each of our eight core services, we would have at least one doctor and one nurse for, for each of those. And, and, and so th there are people that, speaking in the other direction that, that it, we should have larger teams. Uh, I think we can keep that uh, to a reasonable level and I think it may easily be that when we do re-inspections we can also have smaller teams when we know what we're expecting and we know where we need to go and, and so I think we will look at that. And you said the final point about value for money is that I think until we know what the impact is, we can't really look at value for money. We can look at expenditure and cost, um, but it's when we get to the point of being able to measure impact that we really need to come back on that um, and, and see what change has resulted. Paul and Eileen, very quickly. Um, let me just add to, there's, a, there's a link point in the. I think the best communication we can have locally as well as nationally is by demonstrating the improvement to services. There's a strong link back to the evaluation point, and that's why we'll bring that back to the board. But the other point is, when we're challenged on the 30 or so inspectors or people that come on site for three or four days, I, I, one of the things we are doing is reminding people that a hospital isn't isn't an, an amorphous entity it is eight we look at eight core services and of course there are multiple other services it really does break down to having teams of about three or sometimes four people looking at the entirety of a pediatric service or the entirety of the medical pathway or the entirety of outpatients and i think it's that comparison that we can also draw out more clearly so maybe a lot of uh, bodies in aggregate but these are also enormous enormous up to billion pound organisations in their own right. I think all I'm suggesting is we need to put that, those communications together, not that, not that there's something wrong with what we're doing. Eileen? Yes, just being very brief, I think it is important to know, and I think Mike would agree with me, that um, actually in terms of sustainability and in terms of the support that we've had from trusts in terms of releasing people, to come and work on inspections, it has actually been very, very positive. If we look at the pipeline of people who are volunteering to take part in inspections in Mike's area, it's very encouraging. And I think the recognition is that actually being involved with the work of CQC, as we talked about earlier, uh, does bring a benefit back into those trusts. So by and large, I think we should applaud the support that trusts are giving in terms of the release that they are making of people who are vital to us. Good. Well, um, Mike, I think, would you convey back to Karen Welch um, that we thought it was an excellent report, very helpful, and I think your response and all our, your response to it has been, you know, just got the most out of it. 
So thank you for that. Um, the rest of the agenda are really for noting, I think. But um, did anyone who's tabled one of the papers, um, Paul, Paul or Anna, want to add anything? Or can we just assume they've been read and noted? Good. Any, any other business from the board? Any questions from the floor? Yeah. Um, I apologize to board members for coming back to the question of cameras. Uh, uh, and I'd, love, I'd really rather say not cameras, but surveillance, because I came across an extremely interesting case uh, at the weekend of somebody who'd um, uh, discovered some very, very bad care in a residential care home simply by putting a dictaphone behind a chest of drawers. Uh, and although obviously a dictaphone wouldn't have picked up on the slappings and old greenery and that kind of thing, it's a great deal better from the point of view that Robert was raising about privacy. Um, so I would rather hope that uh, that uh, dictaphone audio only could also be remembered in any future sort of things about cameras. I, as you perhaps know, am uh, very much in favor of overt cameras uh, because they're preventative, because they record good care as well as bad. But they are extremely expensive, and I think there is a link that one of the ways to get overt cameras in place is covered cameras beforehand, and this is what has really happened with HC1. They wouldn't really be thinking about having overt cameras now if they hadn't been, uh, open, open house hadn't been picked up uh, on Panorama. Um, so I'm very much in favor of what Lewis was saying about um, helping the CQC, helping people, because frankly, it's quite difficult and expensive and so on to put in an overt camera. I know that myself. And I also would like to sort of help in this myself. And I would want to, I have actually offered to Westminster Council um, that I would establish with my own money a, a bank of cameras, um, which could be loaned out to people temporarily who, who would need them to record care and then could be returned so they wouldn't have to go to a kind of capital expense of keeping the camera afterwards. But I do need some help, and I particularly like this help to come from the CQC because then it would be natural that the reports would come back to the CQC and not to the Daily Mail or, 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 or Panorama. Uh, and I, do, I hope it would not be too much of a breach of neutrality if um, the, there was something was said about that perhaps on your website or in your newsletters. Um, anyway, I'm going to do this anyway, but I hope I can do it alongside you. The other thing is I went to a care home recently, a, a very new one, and I was delighted to find that they already had overt surveillance in their um, uh, communal areas. But they said that they'd been told by the CQC at, when they were being registered, they haven't been inspected yet, that they could not use it for management purposes, which they interpreted to mean that they couldn't actually sit and watch what was going on, which they, I think, felt was a bit of a waste of their 50,000 pounds that they spent on putting this in. And I'd like to know whether that really was a misinterpretation by the inspectors of CQC policy, or whether the, perhaps the care home got the wrong end of the stick and didn't understand what was meant by management purposes. Thank you very much. David, I think we agreed as a board that we would be, we, we would be considering this again in more detail after the summer. Um, but on your specific question, your last question. Um, um, <clears throat> I'll just say, I mean, I don't know the specific example, and, and maybe we, we could share that, because I've certainly had experience recently of a, a provider raising a concern with me that they'd been, they had interpreted what they'd been told as us saying, you've got to take the cameras down. And actually, what had been said was, you haven't actually taken um, a due consideration of the interests of the, re uh, of the residents and hadn't consulted properly, and we would expect you to do that um, be before you use them. So, so there was the, uh, 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 there was misinterpretation. So maybe we could follow up on the specifics, but um, um, you know, if, if people are following the guidance which Rebecca referred to earlier um, uh, about the use of, uh, of cameras, then. Um, I don't, you know, I don't think we have any place to be telling people that they shouldn't use it. Um, and and just uh, to reflect on your first point, I'd certainly be thinking about the broader, because um, uh, there are a variety of te 
technologies that can assist, um, not just cameras. Um, so I think you're right to, to raise the audio, but there are, there are some other, there's, there's one with sensors and all sorts of things. So um, there's, there's other things that we can look at too, certainly. Um, really, uh, this is the first time I've attended this meeting. Uh, my name is John Green, and uh, um, I'm here as a member of the public. But uh, um, my, my background is that I, I, uh, um, I'm a carer for three members of the wider family. Um, uh, my mother-in-law, who's got dementia, and two other members of the family with, uh, that have had difficulties. Um, so to some extent, my experience is through some expertise through experience, if you like. Um, my background prior to retirement was that I was a business consultant with my own business in helping public and private sector organisations to implement what I considered to be world-class management methodologies. Um, and over the past five years, I've been observing and um, researching the NHS. Um, I don't know how many reports I've read. And I've also attended lots of board meetings, et cetera. Um, and I've come to the conclusion that uh, the services that I receive on the front line are very much influenced by what happens at the top of organisations. In fact, when I was a consultant, I went into organisations. It never took me very long to find out by looking at their management systems and work processes, um, the quality of the organisation I was operating in, which I had to do before I started my work. Um, and what concerns me is the, the direction that's continuing to go in terms of using inspection and regulation and target setting as a tool of management. Um, I think what's happening to the NHS is what happened with the car industry in the 1960s to 90s, um, where the, 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 the management regime was dominantly command and control, um, highly directive, um, and many of those managers had very little knowledge of world-class quality management methodologies. And we effectively lost a lot of British manufacturing and uh, our own car industry as a result of that. Um, and that's a big concern I have that we are, the NHS is in a similar state. Um, the fact is the NHS is being compared not with trust by trust, hospital by hospital, it's being compared with all other industries. I wouldn't get on an aeroplane to go on holiday unless there was 99.9% .9 certainty I wouldn't die getting there. Um, and that's what I expect to see in, 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 in the health industry. Um, what worries me is that I've talked with... Um, is it on? Yeah. I've talked with lots of uh, managers, staff, um, uh, people in the, in the health industry... Um, and, and come to certain conclusions. What worries me is that when I go into the organisations, I see no evidence of teams of people on the front line trained in quality management tools and methodologies. I see no quality improvement teams seriously operating to analyse what's going on so that there's continued improvement methodologies. It deeply worries me that the, you know, the good work you're trying to do, in fact, all the boards and all the people I've ever met are all determinedly trying to improve the health service, but I don't think collectively that I'm going to see a result in that. I don't think inspection is the answer. And my observation is that the combination of the CQC, Monitor, NHS England, um, which is a huge body that's sitting, which I've created in a form of the five years of trying to understand how the health service operated, um, it's a huge body which is bearing down on everybody. And, and to me, it seems to create more fear uh, than it does anything else. And fear doesn't result in creative thinking, people pulling together. It results in people holding information, avoiding responsibility and whatever. And that's the kind of culture that I, that I see. Um, in terms of how it ought to be, well, it should be, to me, teams that I can see are visibly trained in quality tools and methodologies, managers that understand what real world-class quality management is all about, um, managers facilitating the process of change rather than directing people. 
And I feel that the whole regime at the moment sitting above these frontline teams, and they're the only people that provide services. Everybody else does not provide me with those services. It's only the frontline team. And so I look up and think, to what extent are these other organisations adding value to these teams? And I don't see much value being added. And I don't believe that inspections, however deep they are, will ever pick up what's wrong and when they're gone, unless there's evidence of continuous improvement, I don't really see any change until the next inspection. Can I um, interrupt that? I think you've, done, you've given an extremely um, perceptive diagnosis of the, the fundamental issue facing the National Health Service, which is how do we get continuous improvement? And um, I mean, we're absolutely clear that inspection is only a, a, a part of that process, and that the, the primary responsibility has to be at hospital level and with clinicians. So I think we would agree completely with that. Um, I think we're going to have to move on, though. Can we can we carry on the discussion over um, coffee? Without yeah, right? so, you can so just, you're there's be... only one more thing I'd like to say. I, I, mm. I have written a paper on this based on all my experience, etc., which you might be interested in mm. reading. I'd be interested to know what your view at some time is of it. I have sent the paper to a number of different places. Some of it has been received with a kind of numbed silence, but others quite high in the health industry and well respected have also read it and considered it has some value. If you could leave it, that would be very helpful. Okay. And maybe we can pick it up with discussion over coffee now. Yeah, thank you well. very much for your time. Good. Is that one more question? Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, briefly on the, uh, serious incidents and never events, uh, which we discussed earlier in the meeting. Um, serious incidents in secondary care sometimes seem to include never events, and it can sometimes be a little difficult to separate them. <clears throat> and whilst in secondary care these serious incidents seem clearly defined, in protocols, they don't seem so clearly defined in primary care. And I wondered if there is any <clears throat> uh, thought given to uh, reporting serious incidents and looking at them during the inspections in primary care. Steve. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think your um, observations are, are valid. Um, uh, on our uh, new model of inspection, uh, we're specifically looking in, under safety at how a practice takes significant events and learns from those. So there's, in all of the inspections, we're asking for those. And as part of the first pilot, in fact, we're going to ask for evidence before we go in continually. Uh, the reporting of serious incidents from primary care, there is guidance on that, but the uh, reporting is inconsistent uh, across the country. And I think um, we uh, have a role to play in working with NHS England and those leading on safety there uh, to try and improve that. Uh, the other observation for general medical practice, having been a GP for since 1986, is that uh, we go through waves of enthusiasm about continuous quality improvement, uh, uh, clinical audit cycles and learning from them. And our observation is we're at a bit of a dip at the moment. Um, the peak a few years ago when uh, practices all had to demonstrate learning from completed audit cycles. And whilst that's in revalidation at the moment, uh, we're not we're finding it difficult to find great evidence in lots of practices. What we want to do is stimulate practices to do this rather than just, as you said earlier on, just do it for an inspection. And so uh, we had a big meeting about this yesterday and we'll report back further um, as we move into real action in October. But very good points. Good, thank you very much. Uh, we'll break for coffee.